Mike's going. All right, people, we're live on the YouTube, and I've got the sage of the alt-right. <laughs> without the rage, without the rage, apparently. The sage without the rage of the alt-right. Ben Shapiro, welcome back. Hey, how's it going, dude? All right, we got a lot of things to talk about. I want to cover a ton of new ground. I read your book over the weekend. Well, you thank you for a, doing that. You have a new PragerU video going up. You're still doing this Daily Wire thing and a thousand other things. So we got a lot to do here, but let, let's just start with this alt-right nonsense. Um, I hate that we even have to talk about it. It's so freaking stupid, but this happens to be the world that we live in at the moment. So about two weeks ago, or about 10 days ago or so, uh, The Economist did an interview with you. Uh, I assume that was by the phone, probably? Yeah, yeah. Originally, yeah. So you did a phone interview with them, and they It's then... perfectly nice, the interview, by the way. Like, you actually read the transcript, it's perfectly nice, a little bit adversarial, but that's good, that's fine. They it... usually are, Shapiro, that's yeah, how exactly. it works, right? <laughs> like, the interviews themselves and the thoughts usually stand on their own. Anyway, they, they published this interview, and what was the uh, title? It was called Ben Shapiro, The Alt-Right Sage Without the Rage. Which is wrong on at least a couple of scores. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, the funny thing is, half the media tries to portray you as if you've got this evil rage within you all the time. So right. I thought I thought that was funny on itself. Which is weird because you've met me, and I'm, I'm fairly calm. This like, is as nearly ragey. all the time. This is about as rage as it gets, right here. Yeah. So okay, let's put aside the rage yeah. part, the alt right part, and just what the media is constantly doing. So okay, so after you publicly then shame them for it, and everybody jumped on board to to defend you. Um, and you know all these things got thousands and thousands of retweets. Eventually, they did uh, print a retraction. They apologized. They, they apologized, they had... and they you know they printed they this the retraction headline, where yeah. basically they just said, "Oh, he's not part of the alt right." And it's like, well, what what just happened here? Right. You guys just said he's the sage of the alt right. There is this thing called the Google machine. Yeah. And if they had just typed in my name with alt right, they would have seen probably the first result is a piece I wrote for the Washington Post in 2015 talking about how evil the alt right is. If they, I mean, it was a review of the book. I mean, the, <laughs> in, in the book, which you have read, yeah. I referenced the alt right, I think, three or four separate times and talk about how terrible their ideas are and how evil their ideology is and the how white supremacy point, is gross. The whole point of the book is that you're trying to show people the clean way to think, uh, the sort of right, right way to think, so that you don't fall prey Correct. to those ideas. The, the Western civilization is not built on race. Western civilization is built on certain immutable principles. That's the basis of the book. It's the basis of conservatism, too, or classical liberalism. I mean, all, all of this is built on the same idea, which is that this stuff is not relegated to race. Like, I'm a Jew, okay? The Jews weren't part of that original white people bargain, if there was a white people bargain. Mm -hmm. And you're Jewish, too. I mean, like, the, come on. I mean, this is all, it's all bullshit. But it's, but, and I, I've done open battle with the alt-right for legitimately years. I mean, I, I always cite the stat just because it's a useful stat, but it's true. I mean, I was attacked more than any other Jewish journalist online in 2016. Yeah. The vast majority of that crap was from the alt-right. The alt-right still hates my guts. I have to have significant security around me nearly all times because of the number of threats we get from people on the alt-right. And I'm being called alt-right by The Economist, which is supposed to be a center-right magazine so in Europe. So what is that? That, I think, is the question. It's like everyone gets it. This is what the media does. They don't mind. They lie, they label, they smear, all of those things. Everyone understands that. But what is it? The Economist is basically a respectable, as you yeah. said, center-right magazine. This, these are people who you would think ideologically basically line up with you. So what do you think is truly going on there? Is, is it purely just the quest for clicks? Put Shapiro's picture up, put alt-right, all hell is going to break loose. I don't loose. think so. What is it? What is it? I tend to hold by you know the Hanlon's razor idea that it's mostly ignorance and not malice, uh, and I think for some of these people it it is ignorance. I think that for the Economist, then they they apologized within a couple of hours. I, I think it legitimately was there was somebody writing a headline who doesn't know what the alt right is. They don't know the difference between the alt right and conservatism in the United States and in Europe the alt-right is a lot closer to European right-wing populism than the alt-right is to American conservatism right. in a lot of ways. And so I think they just figure anybody who's anti-left is alt-right. I mean, they've, they've labeled Jordan alt-right, they've labeled you alt-right, right? I mean, like, not the economist, but a right, lot right, of right. people in the media will do this routine. They'll, they'll say that the IDW generally is alt-right. I believe I'm the only registered Republican, as far as I'm aware, in the, in the <laughs> IDW. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you it's, got it's a lot absurd. of people that voted for Bernie. Yeah, exactly. That, there, there are more people who voted for Bernie than voted for Trump yeah. among members of the IDW. I think that's fair to say, correct? I, I'm yeah. pretty sure that's true, right? I mean, I think Brett voted for Bernie. I think that Eric voted for Bernie. Uh, I know that uh, Sam voted for Hillary. Like, they, there are many more members of the political left. I voted for Gary Johnson. Right, you voted for Gary Johnson. I didn't, vote, I didn't vote at all in the 2016 election at the top of the ticket. So I'm not sure there was one person who voted for Trump. 
in the IDW, but we become alt-right because if you're a heterodox thinker or if you're somebody who asks questions and then comes up with, with answers that specifically are designed to reject the alt-right, mm -hmm. then you are suddenly a member of the alt-right just by taking the question seriously. And this is part that's really dangerous, right? You see this with Steven Pinker. I think this is the best example that I saw. You remember Steven Pinker gave this speech? Yeah a few years back, where he said, you know, the problem with the rise of the alt-right is that there are a bunch of people on the left who are rejecting the question, mm -hmm. and then they refuse to give an answer to the question, and so people go looking for the, the answer, and the only answer they get is the worst answer. Right, he wasn't defending the answer, he, right. that's the point. The whole point of his speech was, no, we need to give the correct answers so that people don't fall prey to mm -hmm. the stupid crap that's being said about race and IQ, for example. But we can't ignore the questions about race and IQ, because otherwise people are still gonna look for the answers to these questions. And what he's saying is, effectively the same thing that people you know, in the religious community are constantly saying about, you know, you see people who go to Sunday school and then it's like, well, I asked all my questions and the rabbi or the pastor or the priest, they all said, you know, you're not allowed to ask those questions. And so I left the religion. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's what Pinker is saying about logic and reason in Western civilized ideas, that people came in and they asked these questions and instead of the questions being answered, people are like, you're not allowed to ask that question. It's a very bad question. And you saw Vox did this to, to Sam Harris, right? When Sam was talking about race and IQ. And when people say that, when people ask about whether Islam has a problem with violence, right? Then, then this is considered an alt-right perspective. And so they'll ban Jordan's book in Christchurch mm -hmm. from, from Wickholes briefly, based on the idea that Jordan has suggested that Islamophobia is an overused term and is misapplied, right? That, that's, that's well, he somehow... also took that picture with the guy in the shirt. With a human. The, the, with a human, and you've done many of these, and I've been on tour with Jordan. I, he said he's been taking pictures with about 30,000 people. That's yeah, I would imagine that's a low-end estimate, probably. I've been there where he's had lines of hundreds of people. Of course. After giving a two-hour lecture, after doing 10 interviews during the day, after flying into the city that morning, the idea that he's you know, investigating what everyone's wearing, or that anyone is paying any attention to that. Whether forget what you think about what it would say or, or unless say unless the shirt legitimately is a giant swastika it, or yeah. a giant hammer or sickle or something. Yeah. But you like people are milled through every ten seconds. I mean, yeah. they legitimately come up, they take the picture, they shake your hand, they leave. I mean, yeah. I've, you, know, you guys have done tens yeah. of thousands of pictures. I've done tens of thousands. I don't remember any of the pictures that I took. I mean, legitimately, I remember. But the idea them. was that he took a picture with this guy and now we're gonna- Right, now we're gonna ban, ban his book because and he's then, And then the Cambridge thing, which is even worse. Right, that, that, that was even worse. But I mean, even the New Zealand thing where the, the notion that you are going to be able to crack down on white supremacy by banning speech generally is so dangerous. And listen, if white supremacy were cracked down on, I'd be one of the chief beneficiaries of the crackdown since they, <laughs> I mean, they yeah. hate me, right? I almost said it. You I, I, said it, said it. I said it on Rogan. I'm not yeah. going to do it again. I'm being really careful about my <laughs> F word use. Yeah, I mean, yeah one of the- Very one, selective. One, one, I mean, as you know, because we're friends, one of the bizarre things is how little I curse on camera and how much I curse off camera. It's a lot of F bombs off camera. A lot of F bombs off camera, but- <laughs> I said, good morning, Ben. Good fucking morning yeah, to you, Correct, Ruben. exactly. Yeah. But it's, but I mean, New Zealand legitimately is now gonna prosecute people who downloaded the manifesto for the white supremacists. And I thought to myself, well, I downloaded it because I wanted to read what was in there so yeah. that I knew how to rebut it. I mean, the solution to this stuff is not to crack down on speech, so it's really what, scary. All right, so there's so, so much I wanna do here. So just go, let's go with that for a second. So in a case of what happened in Christchurch, do you think actually that reading it does add value? Because I get you wanna understand it a little bit, at least the people that are talking about right. it. Right. But in another way, doesn't it just incentivize other people to do crazy things? Because yes. then it's like, holy shit, Ben Shapiro, all these all these internet people, they're gonna read what I said, even if it's complete insanity, so, and this thing had conflicting. I, I openly you know, said, people, don't yeah. mention the guy's name, don't don't repeat his his ideas. Yeah. And don't, you guys never publish we, names. We don't publish anymore, names right? of shooters, we, we won't do it. Yeah. Uh, and I even instructed our people, like only report on the manifesto to the extent necessary to knock down myths about the manifesto. Mm -hmm. And that was the big problem. The reason that I downloaded it was not because I originally wanted to read what the guy said, because you don't want to give that credence. It's because the media started immediately misreporting what the yeah, guy yeah. had said. and effectively doing exactly what he told them to do, which is report on everything that I say so, to, so as to divide people, and then the division itself will create more polarization in society, which is what I want. I mean, he says this in the this manifesto. Exactly what he said. And, and, the, and the media were like, yeah, let's, let's do that thing, which is, you know, it's interesting which manifestos they choose to report on and which ones become irrelevant nearly as soon as they are released. I mean. Right, that's a, a, the, the, a whole the, other show, really, in how they decide what is relevant. But I, but I will say, relevant. regardless of, like, I don't think it should be distributed, I don't think people should read it, but if you do pick it up and read it, I don't think that you should be arrested for that. I mean, criminalizing people who downloaded a file seems to me really, really dangerous stuff. Because yeah. you can link virtually anything. I mean, they again, they tried to ban 
the best-selling book on planet Earth mm -hmm. from the biggest <laughs> bookseller in New Zealand because Jordan was in a picture with a human. Like, yeah. I, I don't trust I don't trust anybody to regulate speech that and way. And were they looking to arrest people that shared the video also? I think, yeah, they, I, I they, they were doing so that too. So. And now they're saying they want to hold members of social media hierarchies personally responsible for, for distribution of bad material. This is one of the things they're pushing in, in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, is that they're trying to regulate social media to the extent that they could haul Zuckerberg into court and jail him if certain controversial material was distributed via, via Facebook. I mean, this is not, it's un-American is the easy way to say it, but it's not un-European, I guess. Do you think that's why Zuckerberg, just in the last week, yes. has sort of been hinting off, like, regulate me, please? Like, yes. they actually want regulation now. Well, yeah, I think that what's happening for Zuckerberg Because it'll is, get them off the hook. It, right, exactly. It, it, it's a couple of things. One is, the, he's hoping for regulation from the United States government because he knows he's going to get regulated from the Europeans. And what he's afraid of is being stuck in this catch-22 where the mm. Europeans regulate him on speech. And then, for business reasons, he starts using those regulations as the basis for policing stuff in the United States. And then people in the United States say, well, you're policing and your huh. policing is not even. And so you're actually an editorial outlet now and you should be treated like an editorial outlet as Which opposed to like a platform. There's arguments for that already, I think they right? should, be, uh, I think they should that, do it yeah. for, for a long time. I think they should be treated like an editorial outlet if they're gonna act like an editorial outlet. Um, but he, he's stuck sort of between a rock and a hard place. Whenever you see a business that is calling for additional regulation on itself, you can fairly guarantee that this is a corporatist attempt to crowd other people out of the market and to avoid responsibility. And it seems to me that that's mainly what's happening here. Yeah, all right, so let's back up for a second. So after the, the Christchurch attack, blue check Twitter went completely bananas on you, on me, on several other people. In Sam, our Jordan, oh, oh, everybody, yeah, yeah. Well, a ton on Sam. Um, none of us have ever called for violence, obviously. Of course. Every single one of us have no problem condemning this, want these things to be stopped. Or, I mean, I can see the glossed over look in your eyes as I'm saying it. It's, it's, it's sickening worst. and boring to have to say it. Um, what do you think our responsibility or our, our duty to respond to some of this is? Because it seems to me it's getting haywire. The people that when someone, when 50 people are killed in a horrific attack halfway across the world, when that happens, and then blue check journalists directly blame you, let's say, let's just right. keep this on yep. you for a second. Yep. It seems to me they're putting more of a price tag on your head or a more of a direct threat on your head than anything that you have ever said. I mean, I think that's true. I, I think there's not much I can do about it. I mean, it, it, there, there's certain material that obviously is libelous and theoretically you could take legal action, but I'm a public figure. That means I'm gonna take plenty of slings and arrows and that's fine. I mean, that's, that's part of the debate. I'm the one advocating that we should be able to speak about this stuff as much as we want to. It's one thing for the, the economist to label me a label that is clearly not true. It's another thing for people to draw the attenuated sort of connection between I've criticized Islam's violent tendencies across the world without saying that every Muslim is violent or, and certainly not saying that any Muslim should be treated with violence. I mean, I've never said any of that stuff. Yeah. But if, if, and, and by if the way, you Jewish theologians and Catholic theologians, Christian theologians, have been arguing about what's in the Bible and what it all means and I, all of those I things specifically, forever, it would be insane to say. I specifically say, yeah. and I've been saying this for, as, as long as I can remember, I do not analyze the Quran. I do not analyze the religion of Islam because you can go through the religious texts of virtually any religion, including my own, and find stuff that is deeply uncomfortable and ugly. And that's why I believe in a reinterpretive structure. I mean, I talk about that in the book, and mm -hmm. we'll get to that, I'm sure. But, yeah. it's, but, the, but the fact is that the balance between reason and revelation is very key to my thinking. And so I don't look at the Quran and go looking for verses to take that. I'm not an Islamic scholar. There are many people who are. They're, they're moderate and reformed Muslims who I've had routinely on my, my radio show to try and talk about the reinterpretation of Islam. They are much better situated to do that than I am. All I can do is point out that by polling data, there are a lot of Muslims across the world who believe some really radical things. That if any Christian believed them, the media would immediately say this person is a radical Christian by any definition. Right. So I point that out and suddenly it's, I'm saying that, what now? I'm, I'm, I'm calling for violence against people who I don't know. So who have never, who do, I, don't, I don't know what they, not only I don't know what they think, but they're allowed to think whatever the hell they want. You can think what you want without being subjected to violence. I don't know how they act. I don't know any of that stuff. I mean, it's, it's absurdity on its face. Yeah. And yet the attempt is of course to, I mean, and you saw the media do this. They immediately shifted from, what happened in Christchurch is the result of people who were critical, particularly of Ilhan Omar. You actually saw this, mm -hmm. right? There was this mm -hmm. move to say, well, if you call Ilhan Omar an anti-Semite, then you're contributing to just the kind of Islamophobia that mm -hmm. led to what happened in Christchurch. It's like, wait, hold on a second. Yeah. I defended Ilhan Omar being able to wear hijab on the, on the House floor. I think that's a good thing. I wear a funny hat all day long, right? Like, that's fine with me. I don't care. I think it's good. Yeah. 
I, w I came out originally against Trump's originally formulated Muslim ban when he was like, yeah, no Muslims coming in. I said, this is dumb, this is counterproductive, and it's, and it's intolerant. Right? I said all of those things because those are true. And then it was, but if you critique the fact that Ilhan Omar is clearly anti-Semitic, then you are, le like, this is an attempt to, curb out, to, to carve out speech, right? It's an attempt to say, you're not allowed to criticize X because we don't like you criticizing X. Mm -hmm. And if we can blame this thing over here on you, then that allows us to silence you on this particular issue. So what tactic maybe are some of us missing to clean some of this up? Because I agree that basically what's happening here is there, there is, these people have been incentivized for any time anything bad happens, you blame a few people that have some influence. So let's say you blame Peterson and you and a couple other people because it's like, oh, you guys are helping wake up people to their own thoughts and to how to live their own lives by their own volition and, and all the things that are in this book. So there is every reason to attack you because this is what this right. left and it's, and it's also right? And it's also an easy game because the fact is whoever has been very productive in the public sphere, I'm sure has said things that they don't like. Yeah. I mean, I have a, this, I keep referring to it because it's true. I have a running list of crap that I've said over the past. I've been doing this since I was 17 years old. I'm now 35. So more than half my life I have been doing this. Yeah. I've written legitimately millions of words. I don't remember everything I wrote. Mm -hmm. I've written a column a week since I was 17 years old. I've, I've written legitimately thousands of columns at this point, and I was writing like eight pieces a day when I was at Breitbart, and I was writing four pieces a day for Daily Wire for years on end. I, mean, I don't remember everything I wrote. I remember I have 140,000 tweets. I don't remember everything that I've tweeted. So if somebody points something out to me, I'm like, yeah, that was bad. Then I'm, I'm happy to say, yeah, yeah. that was bad. Well, but you wrote a piece. You wrote a piece for Daily Wire correct. last year, basically. And I update it. Your, your... I do update it. Yeah. People will remind me, and they'll be like, yeah, this was a bad tweet. I'm like, you're right. That was a bad tweet. I did it back in 2008, and it was a dumb thing to do, and I'm sorry that that happened. It's like, I don't remember all that stuff, but. Uh, but it's it's really a bad faith attempt to take down people who are not like this is what Tucker Carlson rightly pointed out when people were coming after him. This was not an attempt to make the public space better. It was not an attempt to mm -hmm. wipe out bad speech that was happening in the here and now because we don't have a time machine, right? We can call up stuff from 15 years ago, like they're, they're digging up interviews from John Wayne who's been dead for 40 years. Yeah. It's like well. I don't know what you want from John Wayne. Dude's dead, right? We can't dig up his skeleton and ask him for an apology. If, if I say something now that you don't like, then we can have a debate over that thing. Mm -hmm. But if you are digging up something I said 15 years ago, all I can do is either say I disagree with me from back then or I agree. And then we can have a discussion about what I think now. But I can't, like, I don't have a time machine. So this is all bad faith, uh, and, it's, and it's really pretty hideous. It's one thing to dig up something somebody has said in the past and then say this fits in with their generalized right. worldview. Right. But to take something out of context and then say, ignore all contrary evidence and then just say, well, this is their worldview because I want this to be their worldview so I can suggest that they're outside the Overton window and we don't have to deal with them anymore. That's, that's ugly, and that's, that's what's happening. I mean, even there's this video that was going around, and it got a bunch of hits from some lefty who had taken, legitimately taken, I mean openly taken stuff out of context yeah. and put it in a video to suggest that I was calling for the murder of Muslims, and it is a lie. It is a full-on, full-stop, absolute bullshit lie. I mean, he took... He took a section from an ad read that I do for a Second Amendment group called the U.S. Concealed Carry Association, in which I say that citizens should be, law abiding citizens should be armed and they should have concealed carry permits because if you are going to be victimized by a crime, the government can't stop that, so you should be able to defend yourself. He took the part where I say the government can't stop this and connected it mm -hmm. to my video about how many radical Muslims there are on earth and then suggested that what I was saying is that you should arm up and go kill Muslims because there are a lot of violent thinking Muslims on earth or extreme Muslims on earth, that now I'm suggesting that you should preemptively take action because the government can't protect you. I mean, he was legitimately taking two disconnected thoughts on two separate topics, cobbling them together, and then suggesting that was my position. It was just an open lie. Was this a public person? Is this, or oh, yeah, this, no, this is a public so person. So this is an actual, with the name. This is a human. Yeah, this is a everything. human. Yeah, not but just it, an anonymous account. So what do you do in a case like that? Okay, you can defend yourself. I yeah. get it. We've all done this. But I'm starting to think that that's not enough. And it's an odd place. And I had Robert Barnes here a couple weeks yeah. ago, a lawyer. And it's like, it's an odd place for the free speech guys to be going, we have to figure out what are the legal protections around speech because it's so not. And I, and I hate this it. This is like in, the worst position for me to possibly be in, right. I think. And yet here we are. I mean, you just defending yourself. Well, the guy's just going to keep doing it. He, right. You get him clicks. Congratulations. Right. And, and that, that is what it is. You know, I'm loathe to either change libel or defamation laws in the United States. I prefer that people say more rather than less. Now, I, I think most people see through this nonsense, and I, if I didn't think that, then we couldn't really have a republic, is the truth. But it's, but yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously deeply disturbing. And as a good person, the first thing that happens, you know, if you're trying to be good, like I'm, I don't think, I think I'm a person who's trying to be a good person. And I think most people who are trying to be good people, when you are critiqued, the first thing you think is, okay, is that true? 
and your first instinct is, did I do something wrong? Mm -hmm. And then the more you think about it, you're like, no, I didn't. This is just bullshit. <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, other than just calling it out when it occurs, I'm not sure what else people can do. Yeah. And, and, and even giving it airtime is a problem because then it just drives them to double down in response and then suggest, no, 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 now he's lying. Now he's lying because they, they want to read in what they, what they want to read in. You can't have a good faith discussion this way and it's not meant to be a good faith discussion. How much do you think is just they want to take you out versus just they want to scare everybody else? Like it's pretty clear to me they're not going to take you out out of fear. Right. right. Like they're not going to. I mean, I, I think that it's, it's, two, it's two things. One, there's always the pipe dream that they'll be able to take somebody like me out. But I think that it's about more than that. It's about making sure that people who are considered inside the Overton window won't even have a conversation mm -hmm. with people like me. So Andrew Yang comes on my Sunday special, and it's great. I mean, it's a really tolerant, civil conversation. I took his ideas seriously. I read his book. I let him speak his piece. It was really nice, very nice guy. I've invited every major Democratic candidate on. Buttigieg had suggested that he was going to come on at one point, and then he just never has responded yet. I'd love to have him on and ask him some questions. And it would be very civil, because the Sunday special is a very civil place. Uh, and that's he got, Yang has gotten excoriated by the left mm -hmm. for even coming on the show. Right? Joe Rogan has me on his show, and he gets hit by the left with, you're having on that white supremacist Shapiro, you're going to get hit just for having me on. That's yeah. the way this works, because if they can alienate enough people by saying, okay, well, we can't give them, if we can deplatform everybody, then it's it's a easy way of avoiding actually having to regulate. What you do is you just make it deeply uncomfortable, and so we sort of, it, you know, do I really want the flack of having on X, right, Y, or Z? Right. So you just shift that Overton window. Well, I guess I got to go this way. You keep moving it left, right, to the point that any that uh, everybody any is outside moderate, of it. Anything is is outside. And 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 the truth is that that's an effective tactic, specifically because there is an Overton window. I mean, it does exist. There are people I wouldn't have on my Sunday special. Mm -hmm. There are people who I wouldn't I wouldn't appear with. Yeah. I mean, I, I've said that before. And so because that's a little murkier of a line, it's easier to manipulate that line. It's easier to say, okay, well, since we all accept that there is this Overton window, then we can use that Overton window and shift the line here and there. Now, it's it's interesting that the Overton window is constantly shifting, as you say, left, in every direction, meaning that. You can express the wildest, most insane views on the left and still be considered well inside the Overton window. Yeah. And if you are as heterodox as Sam Harris, a Hillary Clinton supporter who has said a couple of heterodox things, like I like, I, I want to look at the evidence on IQ and then analyze how much of that mm -hmm. is environmental and how much of that is genetic, and I want to look at how much that affects disparities overall, or Sam saying that you know Islam has a relationship with violence globally speaking, those heterodox opinions mean they're. I mean they're. They'll rule out Sam before they rule out Maxine Waters, right? That's yeah. the way that this works. They'll, they'll rule out anybody. Christina Hoff Summers is too far right for them. She's, she's a white supremacist now. But they'll keep expanding that all the way to the point where anybody's wild opinion is acceptable. Like, the right is routinely throwing people out for expressing opinions that we find unpleasant, outside of our norm, mm -hmm. right? When Steve King came, finally said kind of openly the white nationalist comment to the yeah. New York Times, we threw him out. I mean, we everybody, took away his committee assignments. I donated yeah. the max to his opponent. I raised money for Kevin Feenstra, who's running in his district, yeah. right? And and the left's response was, well, "Why was he even a part?" Ben, you once took a picture. I with took a the picture guy. with him, you took right? A picture with uh, the before guy. he said any, before he said that stuff, Time that was open, ben. right? Exactly. And and so that's what it becomes. Is well, were you once nice to this person? It's like, well, that was before. And also, you guys are roots. Like Louis Farrakhan is still a person who meets with members of the Democratic Caucus. Like mm. what, what? Why is it the, the the window only shifts in one direction? I'm not going to listen to people who tell me about who should be inside the Overton window when they legitimately refuse to throw anyone outside the Overton window, no matter how vile they are. Ilhan Omar just got defended by the entire Democratic <coughs> Congress after saying four, three anti-Semitic things in the course of seven weeks. Right? She was defended by the Democratic Caucus and left with her position on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Well, because they're they're afraid that their own tactics will be used against them. So I would imagine which they will. I mean, Biden's getting it now, right? Well, but, I mean, I've been calling this forever, and it eventually will happen to to Bernie too. It has to happen. That's that's the nature of the beast. How much of this, though, do you think is that by because I see this now because I get a lot of former former lefties, let's say, uh, even some who've been on this show, who publicly they're like this thing. The left has just burned. We we get what it is, but publicly they won't say that they've shifted or that they're evolving or that if you're an old school liberal, you you can actually be okay with a lot of conservative ideas right. or conservative people or, because there's a protection involved. This is right. If you're basically a Democrat or on the left, Joe Biden can run around with a gazillion videos of snipping girls' hair and <laughs> grabbing people and all of that, and yet the people that were going crazy over Kavanaugh have nothing to say about that, that there's just 
just a protection you get as a lefty that you simply don't get. And it's, as... and it's comfortable not to raise your head above the water line. I mean, I, what I, I like to tell a story, on my birthday, so I have a lot, of, a lot of friends in the media or people who I'm friendly with. I wouldn't call them friends because of this, <laughs> because of this, people who I'm acquainted with. The question with. is, would they consider you a friend? Well, the, no, that, that really is the question because yeah. it's my birthday, right? I, I routinely wish people who I disagree with happy birthday online. It seems like a basic thing of courtesy. It's, to, it's, it's somebody's birthday, they're on the left, fine, it's your birthday, happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> people will text me, on the left, happy birthday. I can't do this publicly. They will not tweet happy birthday because they are afraid that if they tweet happy birthday, they have then given me the credence of I was born and therefore I'm a human being. Yeah. And they're gonna get hit with, how dare you wish this terrible person, this this Orthodox Jewish neo-Nazi, how dare you wish that person happy birthday, right? The, the, the effect of being Duplass is a thing. I mean, the, the, the Duplass thing I thought was so telling yeah. and it was so, and everybody knew gut level that if you said that a person on the other side is a human being, that you get hit. But it's funny, I don't get this from the right, meaning that I say Andrew Yang is a human, right? He's running for the 2020 nomination. I treat him really well. I think he's an intelligent guy. I think he's a nice guy. I've said about Buttigieg, who I've never met, he seems like a nice person. Like, I, I, I will say that about the vast majority of people who I disagree with on the left, that they're nice people who I disagree with. They're some who are badly motivated, and those people I try to avoid. But the vast majority of them are like people you'd, you'd want to hang out with and seem like nice people who you can have a conversation with. When is the last time somebody has ever said that about somebody yeah. on the right? That they're a nice person. Joe Biden, you recall this actually happened to Biden. So Biden said this about Pence, right? He said Pence was a nice person. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then Biden got hit so hard that he backed off of it. And he was like, well, you know what? No one can hold the beliefs that Mike Pence can has and still be a nice person. Then, I'm sorry, we can't have a politics. If the idea is that we are, that you are my enemy, that we are no longer even operating in the same sphere, that my politics make me evil, but your politics make you a nice person, how am I supposed to have a conversation with you on that basis? So do you think then that Biden is the last chance for any Democrat to be somewhat centrist or decent for all the disagreements yeah. you may have with Biden? I mean, even in the last week, you've seen it not only with the Pence thing, but he had to do double down with a whole bunch well, he's of on his apology tour, stuff yeah. and he's on the apology tour. But, but when you see how radical the Democrats have gone. And again, this is like everything I was fighting against for all these yeah. years, you know what I mean? Yeah. This was like, guys, this is going to happen if we don't start fixing it, right? Now, I don't even think it's my job to fix anymore. I think right, it right. has to just sort of burn. It's just, it just is. <laughs> it, it, that's very unfortunate because I think, uh, as Jordan would say, you need a certain tension between the right and the left that's a sort mm -hmm. of equal tension, let's say. Um, but do you think Biden's like the last chance for, the, for anything that's sort of I think they're Old carving school Democrat. Yeah, I, I think they're carving out his soul right now, and so we'll see where he stands by the end. I mean, they've taken basically an ice cream scoop and gone through his innards with this, and I, I just I don't know how much of Biden is going to be left at the end of this. I think Biden's initial instincts, and I really don't like Joe Biden as a politician. I think he fibs a lot. I I, I don't like his policies, but I think his initial instinct before he gets political is that he can talk with people on the other side of the aisle. That's why he was friends with McCain for so many years and all of this. I, I think that this is being beat out of him in the primaries yeah. because it, it's just unacceptable. I was hoping the same thing was true about, about Buttigieg, right? I was, I was hoping that Buttigieg was gonna be that, right? He said something like, you know, I don't like the position of Dan Cathy, the head of Chick-fil-A, but they make good chicken, so mm -hmm. I'll eat there. And I was like, well, that's refreshing. Isn't that a nice thing? Like, <laughs> a radical game. I, I know, but that was, the, that was the only moderate thing I've heard in the entire Democratic primary. And now, Buttigieg is switching, and it's, again, Mike Pence hates me, Mike Pence is out to get me because he's a bad guy, and if Mike Pence thinks that I'm a bad person, what he's really doing is he's rejecting God because God made me the way that I am. It's like, whatever Mike Pence's views on the sinfulness of homosexual activity, Mike Pence has treated Buttigieg really well. I mean, there's a bunch of records of him, like when Buttigieg was activated in the military, Pence personally called him up to wish him best of luck in all of that. Like he's never said a bad word about Buttigieg as far as I'm aware. Our friend Rick Rennell, who's the ambassador to Germany, who's gay, right. has only good things to say about Mike Pence. I'm not saying that everything Mike Pence says or believes would line up with everything I believe. Of but, course. But pre Trump has also been president for two plus years. Are they coming for the gays? Right. It's, it, did you, did it's, you bring anyone with you? The, the fact that Buttigieg has to make up a fake Mike Pence, yeah. right, where, where Pence is now his enemy and out to get him, is just, it, it's really telling about the, the polarization of politics and the attempt to shift political differences into character assassination. This idea that Pence disagrees with me about same-sex marriage and therefore he actually hates me. And it's like, well, you have no evidence whatsoever that that is the case. Like, but also, none. you're allowed to hate other people as long as you don't want laws that are different for them. Right. Well, you are it, allowed to hate people. It just is, right? You're I allowed mean, to be mean. You're allowed to not like. I people. mean, I, I and and I think more importantly, you are allowed to dislike the behavior in which others engage, so long as you are not 
attempting to compel them to either engage or not engage in behavior. Like this is, like, I think that there's a fundamental distinction that every religious person understands and a lot of non-religious people don't when it comes to issues like homosexual marriage uh, or same-sex marriage, which is, I don't like a lot of things that people do. I'm a religious person, right? That means that there are a lot of things that Jews do. Like you don't celebrate, you're, you don't take off Shabbat. Right. In, in, I've actually been trying to a little bit more. Right. Well, that, that's good. Well, that's mostly good. Because I want to but, get off my phone. But yeah. bottom line is, yeah. you or anybody, yeah. anybody else, lots of Jews don't celebrate Shabbat. That's yeah. a sin from where I sit. Right. Yeah. That doesn't mean that I dislike you. Right. I mean, I sin all the time. Right. I violated Shabbat before, either by accident or a while ago when I wasn't from on purpose. Like, the, I, I do stuff in my daily life all the time where I think, am I, am I sinning? Like well, the, the religious, you're not a perfect human being. Well, this is, but this is the religious thing. Religious people understand that nobody is, and so when we look at somebody engaging in a behavior that we deem sinful, it's not like we're sitting there all day going, oh, well, look at that sinner. It's like, well, right, that's, that's human beings, right? We all sin, that's what we do, and as long as I'm not trying to compel you not to engage in the sin, what do you even care? Like, it's, it's confusing I, I mean, to how me. how many times have I said to your face, I actually don't care what your most personal belief is on gay marriage. I genuinely don't care. I know right. this will be clipped a zillion ways to sound people. The, the, now you're the anti-gay. Taller, yeah, the taller yeah, lefties, is, or now Rubens, you know, and it's like, but I, I really mean well, that. As and I've said on your you, show. If you were out there right now, if you were campaigning for people that wanted to flip gay marriage, or, or every day you were doing diatribes about how evil gay people are, and right. th then we would have a problem. Right. But by you taking the libertarian position, and, you're, and maybe from, from your moral center, and we'll, we'll get mm -hmm, into that mm -hmm. shortly, uh, you're not thrilled with it, Okay. Right. Uh, guess what? I live well, in a country with people that I don't agree with. This okay? is, and this has been my perspective. I mean, I said this on, on Rogan's show. This is, like, there are legitimately millions of people in this country who believe that I will go to hell because I don't believe in Jesus. And you know what I think about that? I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. Like, it makes no yeah. difference to me. Yeah. Fine. You're not coming after me? That's the best thing that's happened to Jews in thousands of years that people aren't coming after yeah. me. So, like, yeah. good. You know, believe what you want as long as you're nice to me. And as long as you are, and as long as you But are, I don't even think you have to be nice. Well, I, no, I right? mean, but, uh, I mean, as long as you are, uh, yes, first of all, you don't have to be, right? right. I mean, like. Uh, you mean I, civil, as long as you're basically civil, civil within I mean, the laws. Uh, right, and uh, as long as you are not using the government to compel me to do things. And when I say nice to me, I mean, if you're not, over, like, people, look, if we're talking about if I like somebody or not, if you're overtly mean to me, I'm not gonna like you. But when it comes to politics, as long as you're not trying to compel me, I don't even care whether you like me or not, or I like you or not, I mean, that's. Uh, this is why, in my view, libertarianism is maybe the only way we're ever going to be, be able to survive this stuff, because if we don't leave each other alone, we're just going to club each other into submission. I mean, that's why I've been ranting and raving about all this. All right, so let's let's shift to the book a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I, I really enjoyed it, and then this morning you put up, a, or Prager, you put up a video that basically is in conjunction mm -hmm. with the book. So first off, the title, The Right Side of History, that's what the lefties always say. When, right. When you mean, I hate that phrase. When, yeah, right. no, I know. I've tweeted so, it out that I hate so, yeah, the phrase. So let's right. talk about that for a second because that's what they always say. Every time a conservative or anyone on the right remotely says anything, they always say you're on the wrong side of history. Right. So, and Obama most famously used that to talk about same-sex marriage, right? If you were anti-same-sex marriage, then this meant you were on the wrong side of history. And this, who, who was the guy that ran against game set? Uh, yeah, that, that, correct. Frank? He was on the wrong side of history at that yeah. point, though. Yeah. Then he became on the right side of history. The reason that I, I used the phrase, obviously, was a bit of a poke in the eye to that phrase. And it's a play on words is the, you know, the conservative side of history, the right side of history. But, yeah. there's a, but there's also this idea that what I don't like is using history as a club to beat someone with when it hasn't unfolded yet. So people will say, you're on the wrong side. You don't agree with me on tax policy. Well, that's because in the future, it will be proved that I was right and you were wrong and you were on the wrong side of history. That's what Obama was saying about same-sex marriage was people who are saying that traditional marriage has been X for thousands of years, those people are on the wrong side of history because history will justify my position and they will have been shown to be non-progressive and non-decent. Maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong. You don't know yet, history hasn't progressed yet, right? But right. there are certain things that It we, would be very scary though if that was true, that we would, once things change, that you would look back and think that the thousands of years before you, and this is sort of what you're talking about in the book, that all of the people that believe different things were, were backwards or evil or on the wrong side of things. I mean, it takes, in. It, no context of how they lived. The right, and, and again, I think there's a difference between looking, back, saying, here's a bunch of good stuff that we have in today's society, and here's all the things that we love. Where did that come from? And that's when I say the right side of history. Here's the stuff that we know that is right, and where did that come from? Okay, so that's the right side of history, as opposed to, here's my politics today, here's my political position. I have not a lot of evidence historically that it's gonna work or it's not gonna work, but it will be proved one day that you are on the wrong side of history if you oppose me. You're not really talking about history, you're talking yeah. about you know, you are, you're basically forecasting into the future something that you can't possibly know. So that, that sort of use of the phrase is, is highly irritating to me. 
especially because there are times when their politics in the ascendancy that are really ugly and are proved later to be completely wrong. I mean, there was a point where Jews were pretty regularly getting murdered in Europe. They were on the wrong side of history at that point, <laughs> right? And then it turns right. out that in the long run, they're not on the wrong side of history. The Nazis are on the wrong side of history. If you'd said the opposite in 1934, people would have thought you were crazy. So you can't really say where history is going. Mm -hmm. What you can do is look back and say, here's where history has gone, and here's what we like about what history has been, and here's where we have broad agreement. And that's really what I'm talking about. Where are the issues where we in Western civilization should have broad agreement, and why is that broad agreement starting to fall apart? Yeah. So you know, the IDW is a great example of this. There's not a lot of agreement on policy in the IDW virtually at all, but there are certain basic principles that we all kind of take for granted. Democracy is better than dictatorship. Free speech is better than limited speech. Personal responsibility is better than shirking personal responsibility. Like these are things that, that everybody seems to basically take in common. Mm -hmm. And so what I say is, okay, where did these values come from? Because they didn't spring up in a vacuum. And the fact that we have great material prosperity and free markets and wealth and all of this great stuff, that did not happen either by accident or everywhere at once. So, so it's this not is my, just magic. It's not just some sort of man-made magic. So let's talk about right, the, so let, this let's is, talk about the two cities then. Let's let's start yeah. in, let's start with Jerusalem. Take so, me to Jerusalem. Okay, so the so the basic thesis of the book is a very Straussian the, thesis. So Leo Strauss, famous 20th century philosopher, he he posited that Western civilization was predicated on these two poles that were constantly fighting with one another. One was Jerusalem and one was Athens. So Jerusalem was the idea of Judeo-Christian values that undergirds our social fabric. The vast majority of people who are members of a community are members of a Judeo-Christian community in the West, obviously. And there are certain values that are inherent in the Bible that are different from most pagan cultures. So, for example, the, the Judeo-Christian ethic, and we can discuss where that comes from. You know, Jordan would say that it's rooted in, in human nature and then manifests in the Bible. Uh, people like Sam would say that it's sort of an evolutionary hangover, um, but you know, we can get to whether the revelation actually occurred or not. But the, but the basic premises of Judeo-Christian revelation, there, there are several of them. One is that there is such a thing as an orderly universe. So this seems perfectly obvious to us now that, that we can discover the rules of science, that things are out there that make sense. But for a huge majority of cultures over time, that was not true. It was mm -hmm. you worshiped various gods because they were arbitrary, they were fighting with each other, and you tried to appease one at the expense of the other. There are no discoverable rules to the universe. Is it weird though that you have to take a leap of faith to get to a place that it starts with order? Isn't that yeah? An it's it's an interesting. It is, and this right? is this is one of the points that I make is that people see reason and revelation as intention, okay. but the point that I keep making to Sam whenever we discuss this is that Sam makes a leap of faith too about these principles. He and I started the same principles. It's just that I acknowledge that I'm making a leap of faith to get there, and he thinks you can reason your way back using sort of a priori reason to these fundamental principles, like the orderliness of being able to discover rules in the universe. I don't think any of that is, is perfectly obvious to the human mind, nor do I think that for the vast majority of human history people thought that. You know, people tended to think that basically you were a cork bobbing about on the eddies of chaos, and that there was no real way for you to, to discover any logic to the universe. So the, the idea of the Bible is there is a God. The God creates a universe using a mind. That mind is orderly in nature, and there are certain logical rules that that mind uses, and then we are created in the image of God, which has a couple of separate implications. One is that our mind reflects his to the extent that we can grasp at a certain level what exactly is the order of that universe. And then the second is, the actual meaning of that we are made in the image of God, it means that each of us has inestimable value. Now, that is something that, again, we tend to think of as perfectly obvious, that we are all valuable human beings, but all was restricted to the tribe for most of human history, and we are reverting back to that now, mm -hmm. which is all, you know, we are all valuable except for that guy. That guy's not valuable, <laughs> screw that guy, right? He's a member of an opposing tribe. And so the story of Western civilization is the broadening out of that principle that we are all made in God's image to all. Yeah. Right? That's why when people say, okay, well, Western civilization had slavery and Western civilization had racism, it's, that, all that's true. The question is why Western civilization got rid of those things or has been trying to fight those things, whereas other cultures have basically reinforced those things or have decided those things are okay and that tribalism is, is, a, is a good thing. So what do we do then about the people that always want to focus on the bad part of it? Because one of the things I liked in the PragerU video, you made a point of saying, yeah, a lot of bad things have happened. Right. The West has made mistakes along the way, but that the arc has bent so that there is more freedom, there is more wealth, there is more prosperity, all that. But it seems to me that, and I think this is what's happening on the left by and large, 
is that if they could step back for a moment, they might see that it's a lot better. I mean, every college gig I go to, I go, I always open it up to the crowd. I say, does anyone have it worse? I say this to the hecklers, yeah. and they never respond. Does anyone in this room have it worse than their grandkids? And nobody ever says yes. It's almost impossible. You can't. If you I live mean, in the United States. If you're yes, an honest you could human. Be an, your grandfather could have been an oil baron and then lost it. Right. That's pretty they'd much be happy, it. They'd be happy for that, too, because <laughs> they don't want inherited wealth to go through the generations, right? right? But the point is, it's very hard to get them to look at that. What, what do you think? What do you make of the type of mind that always goes to the the worst? Is that because of the disconnect with yeah. Jerusalem? In, in your I opinion? mean, yes, because I think that to to a certain extent, you ha and this is sort of the thesis of the book is that if you're ungrateful for the society that you've been given, that's because you don't understand the society that you've been given. So, we tend to think of all this stuff as natural. It is completely unnatural. This is a point that Jonah Goldberg makes in his book, right? The prosperity, the fact that you have a baby, the baby will live to 80 in the United States, barring some sort of cataclysmic health event. The fact that you are going to live not only in relative prosperity, but the greatest prosperity that any human being has ever known. Mm -hmm. You can go on a machine and click a button and a product that you like will arrive at your door in two days, made in 10 different countries for an affordable price that costs you less than an hour of labor, right? Yeah. I mean, like, but thank the, God those people aren't going to New York right? <laughs> with those 25,000 exactly. jobs. But yeah. it, so, so I think that one of the great debates of our society right now is that on one side you have a bunch of people who say, okay, well, that's, things are awesome. Things are historically awesome. You wouldn't want to be born in any other time, in any other place. It's an amazing place. And all of the problems of history exist. But what that's about is us struggling to maximize the principles that were good in their inception. And then it's a question of fulfilling those principles. And this is true for the Declaration and the Constitution. And yes, slavery was contemplated in the Constitution. And that was a great evil. And then we fought a great civil war. And then there was racism that was implicit in American society. Then we fought, uh, we fought ourselves using these great universal principles. And you would say that, that's always ongoing, right? That's, there is, it's an ongoing, no end. Of that course. Is, there, there's no end point at which all human sin has been alleviated because we're sinful creatures and we tend to revert back into all of these things, tribalism and racism and, and illogic and all of these, these things. But, but the fundamental principles at the root of the civilization are good. And then you have a bunch of folks who say, Right, we have a lot of prosperity, but look, there's still racism, there's still sexism, there's still bigotry, and that's because the actual natural state of man would be the prosperity, it's all this other stuff that Western civilization added. And that, I think, comes from just a complete ignorance of the realities of history in the world, which is that everything bad that has happened in Western civilization, yes, is truly awful and evil, and also has existed in virtually every other civilization in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. The question is, why is the good stuff happening? Right, the natural state of man, Hobbes was right about this, it's nasty, brutish, and short. The natural state of man is not the Rousseauian noble savage living out there enjoying the fruits and the nuts. I mean, that's not exactly what was going on. Mm -hmm. right? This is the point that, 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 as I say, Goldberg makes, is that something happened, and suddenly we are all living in paradise. So but, what was the thing that happened? So, th and this is where, on the one hand, I really accept Goldberg and Pinker and the Enlightenment argument and, and Sam's argument and Michael Shermer's argument. I love the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. It's so funny. People have characterized this book as anti-Enlightenment. No, it's very anti-French no, Enlightenment. Half the book is is actually. I mean, the Athens right. portion of this is about Co the correct. It's, it, it, yeah. it's it's funny how people sort of see what they want to see. So I've gotten letters from religious people saying, "I don't think you're taking seriously enough the contribution of religion." And then I get people from the <laughs> secular humanist side going, "I don't think you've taken seriously enough the contribution of Athens." Like, no. The whole point is that these two things are in tension, and not only are they in tension, but that tension is necessary. I describe civilization as effectively a suspension bridge. And on one end you have certain principles you must take for granted and that are embedded in the Judeo-Christian tradition. And on the other hand, you have all the reason that must be used in order to not end up in theocracy land. And these two things are pulling against each other and pushing against each other and pulling against, and that's the history of Western civilization. And I think the, the greatest balance was reached in the American founding and in those principles. And then those promises were expanded outward to a broader and broader group of people. And that's the story of the West as opposed to Western civilization is, the, the Marxist take is that Western civilization is effectively a power hierarchy. All these principles are a lie, and that the principles are a simple gloss on, on what is a, a reversion to a power hierarchy. So, for example, there was a, somebody on the left who got very upset because in the section of the book I say, you know, we used to believe that we were brothers and sisters. We seem to believe that we had these principles in common. And people were like, who's we, Kimosabi? Because a lot of, because a lot of black folks were not included in that bargain. A hundred percent true. But if you go back as late as 2006, 2007, 2008, you can look at the poll numbers. People believed that racism was receding in the United States. People mm -hmm. believed that effectively we were trying to get rid of all of this stuff. And the reason that we've been able to curb racism in our society, the reason we've been able to curb sexism is because we were able to use these principles to overcome the natural tribalism and sinfulness inherent in human beings, right? So when I say we used to believe we were all brothers, 
we did believe that we were all brothers, but then we expanded the definition of brothers. That was the story, right? Mm -hmm. we, the, the reason that Western civilization has been effective is because we have these principles. The principles are good. We were too restrictive in the use of those principles. And then using reason, we broadened out those principles to encompass more and more people. So when I say we used to consider all of each other brothers, that was true in theory and not in action. And then it was broadened out to action, and that's what's made our world a better place. So is that part of the problem right now, is that we're in our eating fruits and nuts stage here in the West. We are in such spectacular wealth and freedom and all of those things, and of course, everybody's not wealthy, and we have a right. homeless problem and all sorts of things, and there's problems, there's mental health problems and everything else, but that we have so, by and large, conquered racism. We have so by and large conquered all of the inequities in society. Not all of them, but we've, we've done a pretty good job. Right. As, you're we, saying, I mean, as you're saying, it's a, the train is still going. Right. But that, the, that then becomes the weakness. That then people, young people, I mean, if you look at the millennials and now everything that was born out of this new progressive lefty thing, it's that it's not perfect, so we must burn it down. So it's almost that that is now, it's a symptom of the success. It's right. almost a, It's almost a inevitable symptom of this. Well, that's right. I mean, this is what I talk about in, in the book when I get to, you know, sort of the philosophy of the 1960s, which was we need to replace the heart of stone within man with the heart of flesh. It was a religious concept, but it was from a Marxist idea, which was there is something fundamentally wrong with the Western soul. And what we need to do is shift the entire system. This is the Marxist. The, the actual Marxist pro, pro, uh, promise is not you're going to be wealthier and, and more spectacular in your living standard than under capitalism. Very, very few Marxists actually make this claim, and if they do, they're ignorant. Uh, the, the actual Marxist claim is that it will fundamentally change the nature of human beings mm -hmm. to live in different relations with each other in a certain economic system, and we will become different humans. Now, the conservative view and the religious view is, no, you won't, right? I mean, you're going to be exactly the same human you were before. The, mar the system can change. Human beings are always what they are. You can alleviate certain material conditions that make people more likely to be less stressed, for example. But overall, human beings are sinful creatures. We tend toward, toward tribalism and anger. We have to train ourselves to be good. Anybody who's had kids, I I'm frankly astounded that anyone who has kids buys into the Marxist. Thesis, because <laughs> the notion that kids are that the people are inherently good uh -huh. is such absolute utter crap. That doesn't mean we don't have good instincts. We mm -hmm. do have a good instinct, but that is balanced with a very selfish instinct as well. I mean, I, I know there's a there's a new book out. I'm trying to remember who who's the author. It was just reviewed in the Wall Street Journal, talking about sort of the natural goodness of of human beings, and I, there there is some of that. I mean, I look at. As, as Jordan likes to talk about, if you look at Piaget, people play games with each other and they tend to form common rules, and all of that is true. There's also a real selfishness to human beings that naturally comes out, and you see it among kids. And if that's not trained, if people aren't cultivated to become better human beings, they just don't become better human beings. And so this is why I say you need to re-examine what it is that's good about your life and then ask, why did it get so good? You didn't build this thing. I, I don't want to, I mean, I, I do want to quote Obama here. Obama says, yeah. you didn't build it when I spend my entire life building a business. But you didn't build the system. The system you were born into. Right? You think that free speech is something that just magically exists here and that everybody is entitled to it? Yeah. Welcome to a thing that, that only exists for the last couple of hundred years and that legitimately millions of people have been killed fighting over. Is this why what's happening right now with the Democratic candidates is so dangerous? I mean, just in the last couple of weeks, so now they're talking about reparations. They're talking about adding Supreme Court justices. They're talking about, there was a whole slew. Give me, give me a couple uh, of other. Yeah, electoral college. Oh, get, they, electoral get, rid of, college. get rid of the Senate also. Uh, they want yeah, to get rid of the Senate because it's not represented by population. Yeah. yeah. All of these things that these are now would be, you know, look, these ideas were man-made ideas, but that they think only in their day, if they can just rejigger the entire way we look at everything, it will be better where I would argue in almost every, I, I can't imagine a case where if we flipped any of those things, things would, would be any better. Yeah, no, I, I really have serious doubts that if you get rid of the Senate, that suddenly people in Montana are gonna be like totally okay with everything. Right, like, right, and, right. Or, or that people, like, let, let's not pretend that people in California Well, because then are, the progressives in the big cities would control everybody, Right, and, and by the way, the people in the rural areas would try to break away, I mean, they would. That's the, the, the I mean, people don't wanna, the, the, the Civil War was about slavery, and there was also a massive economic gap between the South and the North, which was reflected in a lot of the tariff fights that existed up till the Civil War. That was a rural-urban gap, and it's one of the reasons why the North won, is because they had so much more urban power than the South. But 
you know, that, that was about slavery. You could see a certain situation in the United States where the rurals look at the cities and they say, we don't want you ruling us. You don't live out here. What you, why should I listen to a bunch of people who live in San Francisco when I live in the Central Valley of California? I'm a farmer out here. Why can't you leave me the hell alone? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I used to at least be able to punch above my weight in terms of, you, you used to have to take my opinion into account. Now you can just ignore me and run roughshod really? yeah. over me. Why should I be part of that system? I don't buy into your majoritarian system where you are always the majority. That's not something I'm interested in. You know, the, 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 sort of, the, the, checks, the, the founders did not trust pure majoritarianism, and they were right not to trust pure majoritarianism because majorities of people have often believed incredibly stupid and dangerous things. Yeah. That's why they wanted checks and balances. We've sort of run roughshod over those over the course of the last century. But, yeah, I mean, the, the, the fundamental disconnect between conservatives and people on the American left uh, is, was summed up by Chesterton in, in his very famous fence analogy that if you're on the left and you're walking through a field and you see a fence in the middle of the field, just in the middle of nowhere, your first instinct is, I don't know why this fence is here. Let's take down the fence. This fence does not belong here. It's just dumb. There's no reason for this fence to be here. Get rid of the fence. If you're on the right, your first instinct is to say, I'm not going to remove the fence until I know why it was here in the first place. Once I figure out why it was here, then we can talk about removing the fence. And that is true right now in politics. The, the left seems to be saying, I don't know why any of this stuff is here. They even ascribe bad history to these things, right? They'll say that the Electoral College was put in place to protect slavery or some such nonsense, which is just not true. And then, the, and, and then it's like, well, we created this false history. Let's get rid of the thing. I don't know why it's there in the first place. No reason. Dump it. And people on the right, well, maybe we should like think about what the actual possible downsides here are because virtually every action that we take has some unintended consequences. And maybe we overstate the unintended consequences. Like, I think that has probably happened, for example, with gay marriage, right? I used to be anti-same-sex marriage on the legal level, right? Mm -hmm. I used to say, like, I think that if the government legalizes same-sex marriage, that it's gonna have some pretty dramatic impact on how people interact with one another. Um, and then I was, and then before Obergefell, I said we should get out of the business specifically because I don't want anybody imposing their views on anybody else. We can all live how we want and just leave each other alone. And I think the, the right overestimated- What, what kind the, of pushback did you get from religious people on that? I don't know that we've ever actually specifically talked about I, I don't know that I got significantly heavy pushback specifically because I wasn't making the case that you have to overrule your own vision of what sin constitutes. I'm just saying you can't impose that on anybody else. Meaning that if you want to protect yourself from the other side using government mm -hmm. for its argument, then you need to stop using government for your argument. I was making the anti-institutional argument, right. right? I wasn't making the case that everybody who's religious has to reshift away from their religious orientation. I wasn't doing the Hillary Clinton thing. Where right, it's but like, a certain amount of, of religious people, I get that, that's yeah, the argument yeah, yeah. that I make, obviously, but I would imagine a certain amount of religious people, if they're viewing this as sort of a foundational societal belief, that right. if you change this institution. I, I'll, right? I'll tell you, I, I didn't get a ton of pushback specifically because I wasn't coming out against the institution. I think a lot of the pushback that surrounded same-sex marriage was a twofold idea from the religious community. One was, you must personally in your own life accept that same-sex marriage is morally equivalent to heterosexual marriage, and if you don't, you're a bigot. And that offended a lot of religious people. People were like, I don't, that, that's not an argument I'm willing to listen to because you're, you're immediately labeling me a bigot based on both my religious views and a, a view of natural law, which is fairly common to most religions. And I'm not gonna hear that. I think that if the, if the left had approached it as, you don't get to use power, we don't get to use power, nobody gets to use power, the right is much more receptive. That's been my argument all along. That's why I think libertarianism has a lot more draw than social leftism to, mm -hmm. to the right. I think you can right, make- you can solve most of those problems by get, having the government just not be involved. This has been my contention, right? Because what, what I'll say to religious people is, I may even agree with you on the nature of sinfulness of particular activity, but it's none of my business. And not only that, I think that if you make it the government's business, you know, you're all happy to use the government right now for your particular ends, but there's gonna be a time when you're not running the government anymore and they're gonna come for you and you're not gonna be real happy right. about it. They don't seem to like this Trump guy, yet, right. their, yet their answer is more government. Exactly, I mean, so that's why I didn't, I didn't get a lot of pushback when I suggested that because it wasn't coming from a place of me trying to castigate people for their own personal moral views. Mm -hmm. And I think that for, for a lot of the gay rights movement, it was about that, it was about, it was about I'm Did trying to castigate people. If you believe that what I do is a sin, that's because you're a, a non-meritorious, intolerant bigot. Does that and, also show you that the that unfortunately religious people have been tarred with this idea of intolerance when it isn't true. I mean, is that like a really good succinct I mean, I, I think it's a good example it? because the fact is that, listen, has there been religious intolerance toward people? A hundred percent. I mean, like, come on, like, I, I can't pretend that yeah. that doesn't, it exists in the Jewish community, it exists in the Christian community, it exists in the Muslim community. It's true that there's been intolerance. Like, I don't want to portray religious people as all 
completely innocent in this, because obviously that's untrue. There are people who have been excised and treated badly by religious communities. Of course that's true. But this is what I was talking about earlier with, with, with Buttigieg, his treatment of Pence, the, attri the attribution of motive to Pence, as though Pence is sitting there, like, day in and day out, thinking, oh, that Pete Buttigieg and his, and his <laughs> sexual proclivities. Like, that's... Mm, I don't know anybody who thinks that way. If they do think that way, there's something wrong with them, frankly. Yeah. Um, and it's and so that's. And also, we just came out of a of a year of Me Too, where it was like right before all that happened. What was everyone making fun of Pence over that he doesn't well, you know <laughs> go into rooms with other women? And yeah, that may sound odd to me, or you know, all right, that's what he's decided to do. And guess what? Hey, it's he's been not accused of doing some. It's, of these I mean, and frankly, things. listen, that's been Jewish religious law for a very long time. You're not supposed to be alone with a with a woman is not your wife with the door closed. This is like legitimately part of Jewish law and it has been for several thousand years. It's called Yichud, you're not actually supposed to do it. So like Mike Pence did that, I was like, oh well, welcome to the club, dude. Right. <laughs> what, what do you do in a situation like that then? So if you're in your office and, uh, and a female co I mean, we've got glass mean, doors, so it's not yeah. as much of an issue. Right. Meaning like, <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I don't- You've really thought it all through, I mean, I don't, I don't, like, I never want to be in a position where I can be accused of acting with impropriety. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is true for doctors too. Like I'm, I'm shocked that people took Pence that way. I mean, my wife, who is a doctor, when she goes and- Is she, your wife a doctor? She is, it turns out. I can't believe when, it. When she, when she goes in and she examines a patient, when, when a male doctor examines a female patient, the new rule basically is there must be some third party in the room to ensure that there's no claim made against the doctor. It seems to me if you're a prominent person, then you should be considering exactly the same thing. Like this mm -hmm. doesn't seem illogical to me. This just seems like for the same reason that I like body cameras on cops as a general matter, I like evidence and I like people who are there to debunk or enforce the, the, the actual account that happened. So, yeah. Is this another one of those things where they, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, where the idea, of course, is you know, we're going to put everybody in situations where the, you, I wouldn't care. I don't care the person that I hire. I don't look at their, I mean, when we did our last job posting, I made a point of saying, I don't care about your gender. I don't care right. about your sexuality. I don't care about your skin color, et cetera, et cetera. But in reality, because the world is so out of whack right now, the truth, the real truth is, I don't know that I've ever said this publicly, when we were looking at resumes, I was less inclined to hire a gay man because I thought, well, I could be in a room with this person and then they could just announce uh, well, that there, I harassed them. Listen, they're real. And how insane is that? So now you've created a, si because you create the system of incentives that it doesn't help anybody actually. Right, the, 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 and, and you've seen actually this, this sort of thing, materially speaking, in terms of, for example, policies that say that you're not allowed to do criminal background checks on potential employees because there are too many black folks who have criminal backgrounds and so we wanna make sure more black people are employed, you actually end up with the reverse. What you end up with is employers who look at resumes and in many cases cannot check the criminal background of people. And so they say, okay, statistically speaking, it's more likely that a black person went to prison than a white person went to prison. That's not a racial statement, it's a statistical statement of fact. And so I'm just not gonna hire this black person. Well, who gets hurt by that? The right. black guy who didn't commit a crime, right? Yeah. And this is, this is the sort of thing that, that it, like there are dangerous unintended consequences to public policies that are, that are well-intentioned. Again, I think it's a well-intentioned public policy, but I think that it's a, a bad public policy. And to pretend that people aren't people is stupid. People are going to use whatever information they have at hand to make judgments and to protect themselves. And this is, this is, true, if, if, this is true with regard to employers and women taking time off from the workforce. This mm -hmm. is true with regard to sexual harassment allegations. Like, listen, when I was growing up, my mom always said to me, right, and my mom ran businesses. I mean, she, she was a higher up at the company that did Hell's Kitchen. She, she did like major reality TV shows. So she was a high powered woman. My mom worked, my dad stayed at home. And my mom said to me, if you ever get a secretary, get a 70 year old woman, <laughs> right? Because you're never gonna be accused of anything because she's 70, right? Yeah. Like, and <laughs> that was my mom saying that to me. Yeah, and it's not, is, uh, you know, some people have that fetish, but I get it. As a general rule, like yeah. this, but, and, and that's not entirely, like human nature is human nature. And this, there's been this willful attempt to blind ourselves to human nature that I find alternatively hilarious and, and ridiculous and scary. Yeah. It's like, well, we're supposed to pretend that reality doesn't exist because we wish reality were not what it was. And the truth is the, um, the unhappiest people on earth are the people who are constantly fighting reality. Whether you're talking about in your dating life where it's like, I wanna look just exactly as I feel like looking at everybody else who won't date me, it's their problem and yeah. you can't get a date. And it's like, well, maybe it's because you haven't worked out in 10 years, right? Yeah, yeah, you and stink. It, yeah, right, or, or, yeah. or, or maybe, or whether it's in the job market where it's like, well, I wish that I could get this job and I deserve to get this job and I'm not gonna do what I need resume wise to get the job or I'm going to rely on such and such to get the job and then I don't get the job. Or, or I'm gonna sit in this dying town and I'm never gonna leave this dying town because I deserve to have a job in this dying town. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about politics is you can pander to everybody by 
lying to them about these realities, right? Did, did you happen to see last night, I think it was on 60 Minutes, there's a clip going around of this young, you saw this, this uh, med, med student. Yeah. Or they, they interviewed several yeah. med students, and the thrust of it, I didn't see the full thing, I just saw right. what they tweeted out. Uh, the videos that they tweeted out. The thrust of it was all the, these young people, but there's this particular young man saying, you know, if college was free and medical school was free and all that, I wouldn't have to work, and then because of that, I could study more, thus I could be a better doctor. Right. And it's like, hey, there's no proof that that's actually true, and you might learn a lot of things by working and all that. Now, the, the idea that med school maybe is too much money and college is completely out of whack, that's a perfectly legit conversation mm -hmm. to have, right? And we can have that conversation. But I just thought the way it was spun by the Twitter account was like, see, it's obvious. You shouldn't have to work if you're gonna be a doctor. Right. And it's like, no, no. Right. We're it, missing something here. Well, that, that's, so what was funny about that story is CBS News covered it as, isn't this a great example of why we should make medical school right. free? Right. And what actually happened is that there was a donor, I believe it was Bernie Marcus from, from Home Depot, who went to NYU and he donated so, several, I believe it was like $100 million to NYU to pay for the medical education of the kids who went to NYU. So this is a private donor doing something good for these kids. And then they're like, well, what if we just made a government policy? Well, then you'd completely skew the incentive structure is what would happen. Because mm -hmm. I'll tell you what would be the next thing that happened. The next thing that happened is that doctors would be, would be granted free tuition, presumably. And the next thing that would happen is they would say, okay, well, now you have to be regulated. So you need to work for 60 grand a year, at which point the registration rates would dramatically drop and you get a completely different crop of people who are going into medicine in the first place because you know that you're gonna get a free education, but you're only gonna make 60 grand, 70 grand on the other end. Mm -hmm. All those people who right now are paying $200,000 to go to medical school so they can make $400,000 a year coming out, all those people decide to go work at McKinsey instead. That's all that happens because people are profit seeking and wanna live a certain lifestyle. And guess what? After 11 years of this shit, like my wife deserves to, to be able to earn whatever she can earn. I mean, yeah. I've been doing this thing, okay? I've been, <laughs> we've been, like I cannot yeah. tell you how many, how many things we've had to forego. And I've paid for her medical education, right? I mean, I've gone out of pocket for all of it. I've paid for every iota of her medical education and it's cost us a lot of money. She's working for below minimum wage right now because doctors in residency effectively work for below minimum mm -hmm. wage. They're making 40, 50 grand a year and they're working 80 hours a week. And that's what they go through and you know what? That's because they should make money on the other end. The market does have a value in determining what the value of these things are. So you would say the two solutions to that are either the market or private people like the Home Depot guy coming in. That that I mean, basically frankly, is I think, it that it's just it's not perfect. But well, frankly, I don't think that there is a, forced to do I don't it, right? think that there is a serious. Uh, okay, so there are a couple things you can do to bring down medical school tuition. One, you could stop with the licensure requirements for things that nurse practitioners could do. Yeah. Right, because that way you have a bunch of people who are going to nursing school or PA school, and they can do a lot of this stuff. And then you don't have to create this cartel, and the cartel charges a lot of money to, for you to get into it. Mm -hmm. So that would be one thing. But number two, so what? So you take out a bunch of loans to go to medical school, and then you make a bunch of money coming out, which you should make because you have spent a lot of money going in. Like if you want, the question is, do you want your doctors to be people who make a lot of money? Do you think doctoring is an important thing as a society such that you want the smartest people going into it? If you want the smartest people going into any industry, you have to make sure that the pay grade is high enough. Mm -hmm. and. I'm, my problem here is not free medical school. My problem is that it will be used as an incentive to, to force doctors to take less of a cost from Medicare, for example, and then you will get a lesser group of people intellectually than you otherwise would. There's an unintended consequence to this sort of stuff. So is this just the fundamental flaw with almost every argument that comes out of the progressive these days, that if you give free college, that this will somehow ultimately do good, even though we know that there are more jobs disappearing that... You know, uh, that you wouldn't need college. The, 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 the free, you could go to trade school, or or any of these things where it's like we can, or Medicare. The, the free Medicaid college education. The, 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 the free college education argument is one of the worst arguments I've ever heard. It's legitimately a terrible argument. I mean, the idea that look, everybody in college is earning more than people who didn't go to college. Therefore, if everyone went to college, they would all earn more. N that, that, no, that, I'm sorry. The reason people earn more from going to college is because it is a sorting mechanism. If you get rid of the sorting mechanism, you know what will happen? There will be another sorting mechanism, mm -hmm. which is exactly what's happened with grad schools. The vast, a huge number, of, it, like, as you sort, the incomes go up. And as you get rid of the sorting mechanism, there are new sorting mechanisms that are added to the job market and to the educational market. What well, you're actually getting, unless you're actually you know, going there for math or science or something. But as I said, if you go to college, and I went to UCLA and then Harvard Law School, so I have plenty of experience with, with going and majoring in useless things at major universities. <laughs> <laughs> you were a poli-sci major. I was a poli-sci major yeah. at UCLA, which is a useless thing at a major university. The, all that these things are, are twofold. A sorting mechanism, because I went to UCLA and not CSUN, and that means that presumably I'm smarter because it's a higher SAT score to get into UCLA than it is to get into CSUN. And second, a 
an ersatz social fabric where you meet a bunch of people who then you can later on call on as friends, right? And this is what J.D. Vance talks about in Hillbilly Elegy, coming from Appalachia, going to Yale Law School. Suddenly he has a group of people he can call on, and he's part of a social fabric, and he's operating in different social circles. Neither of those two things are going to be cured by universal college because the social fabric goes away because it's not selective anymore, and the sorting mechanism goes away because it's not selective anymore. Right, so, and also, do you get free college no matter what your major is? Well, this so is the other thing. you major in lesbian dance theory, is right. that free college? Correct. And then, and then what did we give to society when you're not qualified to do anything? By the way, Buttigieg is exactly right about this. This he was correct on. He, he says, why are we having middle class people subsidizing people who are upper class? Yeah, yeah, I saw totally that. Totally correct, yeah. totally correct. The people who are gonna end up in college and able to get into college are gonna be the people who would've been able to go to college anyway. We don't need more people going to college, we need fewer people going to college. We need less useless majors. We need people being able to apprentice directly into law school. We need, like, why is it that you have to be 23 and you've gone through seven years of education to go to law school? Why? It makes no sense. Why How couldn't important, you just... when, when you're hiring right now, because Daily Wire is killing it, you guys are growing mm -hmm. fast, you're, you're doing all sorts of stuff over at the office, uh, when you look at resume, I don't know how involved yeah. specifically you are, but I assume yeah, my, my best partner at Jeremy level, is much more involved. But yeah, um, do you even care that much? Work experience matters more than where you went to college, for sure. I mean, Jeremy is a perfect example. Is my business partner didn't finish college. He went to a music school and dropped out after two years. And people used to look down their noses at him. I remember there was a, a very prominent person whose name everyone would recognize who once called up Jeremy, cursing at him because he had not gone to college. <laughs> And Jeremy yeah. was and like, why? Like Jer Jeremy now runs a company that that you know we have close to 100 employees. We we clear a lot of money every year. We gross a lot of money, and the he some of the smartest people I know never went to college or finished college. Like it's it's good for what it's good for, and it's bad for what it's bad for. It's good for pre med. It's good for math. It's good. It would be I got a lot of flack for saying this about about kind of the what we called the North Campus majors at, at UCLA. Uh, the the, uh, the, po the poli sci English history right. majors. You know, I said like basically this is effectively useless, uh, and you should you know unless you're majoring in a hard science, you should think about going elsewhere. Like well, your whole book is about Western civilized philosophy. I'm like right, we don't learn any of that crap when yeah. we go to college anymore. <laughs> well, that's, that's the reason I wrote the book is because none of these people learn any of this stuff. Nobody's ever heard of Aquinas when you go like when's the last time they taught Aquinas at a at a major university other than in sort of religious studies classes? They don't even mandate Western civ anymore at these classes, nor. I mean, like this stuff should be imbibed with your mother's milk. I mean, this should be this should be part of just the generalized educational curriculum. So at, is that if, it, if we want to go down the conspiracy road a little bit, is that part of it too? Is that if you really wanted to keep indoctrinating people with lefty ideas, and socialist ideas, and big government ideas, and all of those things, and collectivist ideas, well, give them free college and then just teach them those ideas for four years, and then you've really whacked them at the knees before they get out. I mean, I think the there is, a, uh, you know, I think you know there is. I mean? It would make sense. Bernie say, "Go, everyone's getting free college, right. and what are we going to do to you at college? Teach you postmodernism." Right. And so then, I, I think I think it's less conspiratorial than that, but I do think that there are a bunch of people on the left who certainly are not upset about the fact that colleges are dominated by the left and who are very angry every time somebody tries to break that domination. I mean, this is why I get banned from colleges speaking about stuff like this. So, it's. You know, it, again, it's it's so a how foolhardy do you policy. It, how do you how do you take the ideas between Jerusalem and Athens, and how do you then just beat the easy ideas of the day? Because that's to me that is where we're at so, right now. We're just at a place of easy answer. Everyone that I disagree with is a racist, bigot, homophobe. I know how to do everything. Everyone before me was evil. All of those things. Let's change everything. The current laws and electoral college and right. everything else. Let's do all of those things because we're so good and everyone else is so stupid. Well, how do you actually beat that? I mean, that, that's what we're right. trying to do right. here, right? I mean, I, I think that the first thing to do is to, is to you know, get people involved in re-educating themselves. And I think you're seeing a tremendous hunger for that, obviously. I mean, this is a book on Western philosophy, and in the first two weeks, we sold well over 100,000 copies. Yeah. It's a book on Western philosophy, right? I mean, that is not exactly pop reading. I mean, that's not, <laughs> it's, right. it's not happy dappy do kind of stuff. So it's, it's, Jordan told people how to clean their room and sold five million exactly. copies. Exactly. That's, that's, really exactly, that, that's exactly right. I mean, like, there, there's a market for, for hard stuff right now because people are looking for something that means something. And we haven't created a much better world with, with the Twitter woke police out there. I, I don't think that people are feeling happy or secure because of all that stuff. So, so do you think it's fundamentally a crisis of meaning? That's really yes. what I took away from your book. Yes. That I, and I really, I was thinking about it over the weekend. It's like, not, we listen, you know, we fight on Twitter all day long. We all siphon off into our own little places. And now between fake news and everything else, it's like nobody really knows, in the secular world, let's yeah. say, nobody really know, has this, and this is the sadness of liberalism right now for me. It's like maybe liberalism didn't give enough through a secular lens 
and and I think maybe you'd argue that's because well, it got disconnected from uh, from uh, Jerusalem. From yeah, Jerusalem. Uh, pe that, that, pe no, that we're in a crisis. We're in a well, crisis of belief. I mean, I think that a crisis of reality. Here's here's, what, here's my real argument with sort of the secular version of the Enlightenment, the French German version of the Enlightenment, which is that by disconnecting the connection to Judeo Christian values. The idea was that we were going to untether ourselves, we'd be able to fly to the stars, we can make our own meaning. And I think people suck at making their own meaning, frankly. I think that generally when people make their own meaning, they tend to fall into hedonism or nihilism. I think that But you there are, some people can do it, right? Yeah, some, like for sure. Are, some people can do okay. it. Some people can do it. Some people can live with this. I mean, I think that Sam seems like a fulfilled guy. Michael Shermer is a fulfilled guy. Right? I think there, there are people who can, who can live with this and make their own meaning. But for the vast majority of people, the answer is absolutely not. You cannot make your own meaning because if you make your own meaning, you tend toward either selfishness or meaninglessness. You need to be told that your life has value and that you're in control of your own life. And there needs to be a rooted, a rooted philosophy to support that. And that begins with teaching these very simple stories. I mean, I, it, fundamentally, I think that religious education begins with the stuff that is harder to believe because that's the most, simplest to understand. It's hardest to believe and simplest to understand, right? The stories in Genesis are the hardest to believe on their face, but they're also the simplest to understand. Like you get from the idea of Adam and Eve that you are not the creator of your own meaning, right? That, you, that the knowledge of good and evil, your knowledge of good and evil, is not the same as God's knowledge of good and evil, and that by attempting to create your own meaning, it's, you're actually egotistically sinning against God. That's, that's the message of the Adam and Eve story. Or the Cain and, Abel, and Cain and Abel story, which is that ceaseless jealousy and a belief in, in your inca, incapacity to take control of your life, that that results in violence and cruelty. Right? That's the, the basic issue of Cain and Abel, which is God says to Cain, you know, Tim Shell, you can do this. Mm -hmm. And then Cain's like, nope, I'm gonna kill my brother. Like, and, that's, <laughs> and, that's, and you see that down, to, I mean, it's an aspect of human nature. You teach these very simple stories to people. David versus Goliath. Right, all, the all of this. The little guy can beat the big guy. Right, right. right. There, there are plenty of, of great stories that, that embed fundamental values, because this is how you teach kids. Everybody teaches kids, secular and religious. You teach kids stories. Like when I read my daughter at night, I'm not reading her from, from Sam's book. She wouldn't understand it, right? Or I, I'm not gonna read her Enlightenment Now or, or How the Mind Works by Pinker. Like, you have to start with certain fundamental yeah. values. The fundamental values are generally rooted in story. This is where Jordan is totally correct. And those are deeply embedded in the human psyche. Uh, and so there's an immediate resonance to a lot of the biblical stories, which is why the Bible has staying and selling power. Uh, and then you use those stories in coordination with reason to expand those stories outward and to develop, right? But, but you have to always stay tethered. I mean, it's, you can lengthen the chain, but at a certain point, the chain breaks, and then, mm. but then you're off and running, and then you got a problem. The, the point that I'm making here is that w I think the West has, has undercut its own allegiance to fundamental principle, and they thought that this would allow the rise of reason to dominate. And what it's instead allowed for is, in the worst cases, some really horrible things. And in the best cases, yes, a continuation of material prosperity, but also, in a crisis of purpose and meaning that's happening to people where they're looking around, okay, okay, I'm a, I'm a ball of meat wandering through the universe purposeless. I don't have free will. I don't have the capacity to, to control my own life. What am I supposed to do now? So I think basically what you're saying is you think it could work for a while, that Athens alone could work for a certain amount of time, As long as it's right? living off the fumes of the Judeo-Christian ethic. And this is the point that I made to Sam when we debated in San Francisco, was I said, you know, Sam, why is it that we hold the same values? Because like, we do, we've, on a fundamental level, we have basically the same values, so why? And he said, well, I've studied this, and I've studied this, I've studied Eastern philosophy, this is where I get my values. So well, that's great, but why are ours the same? Because right? I haven't studied any of those things, so why are those the same? And I don't think it's because I've studied deeply in the Bible and Sam hasn't. I think it's because we both grew up on the fumes of this culture, right? I mean, we grew up 10 miles from each other in Los Angeles. That seems to me a better kind of historical explanation of why we believe mm. fundamentally the same things than that he studied one philosophy and I studied another philosophy. So and, do you think we're in the fumes stage now then? Yeah, I think the fumes are running out. The, I think the Jerusalem what, fumes. You think? Yeah, the Jerusalem fumes. And I think that as the Jerusalem fumes run out, so do the, so do the, the great hopes that were behind the reason-based enlightenment. Meaning that <clears throat> one of the points that I make is that the, the enlightenment makes fundamental assumptions that are unsustainable on the grounds of the Enlightenment, meaning the, the Enlightenment argue, the secular Enlightenment, the non-American Anglo Enlightenment, makes the argument that basically we are Spinoza's stone. We're a ball of meat wandering through the universe, no will of our own, no free will. I mean, Sam wrote an entire book about there not being free will. Mm -hmm. um, and that we don't have the capacity to choose. And when Sam talks about reason, as I asked him before, like, so according to evolutionary biology, reason is just a beneficial firing of the neurons. But you make a moral argument in favor of reason. So my question is, huh. on what basis? 
what if there was a more evolutionarily beneficial firing of the neurons, say genocide? I mean, genocide, and this is Hitler's rationale effectively, mm -hmm. just apply Darwinism to the social sphere and we can effectively wipe out everybody who we don't like and that will better humanity by getting rid of the weaklings and we can move on. Thanos also. Correct, Thanos, ha Thanos is on, on board with this. Yeah. By the way, Thanos has an infinity stone, right? Doesn't he just create more resources? Anyway. Um, the, ah, if you met a genie, what's the first thing you wish for? It's true. More wishes. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But in any case, the, the fundamentals of the Enlightenment, which are reason, free will, the capacity to make your own decisions, are actually robbed by scientific materialism. If you're a scientific materialist, I don't know how you sustain the, like Sam says he believes in objective truth. I agree with Sam there's objective truth. It's, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Jordan doesn't believe in objective truth in the same way, right? Jordan believes in a sort of Charles Pierce, Charles Peirce um, pragmatism with regard to truth, that truth is whatever works. Mm -hmm. and, and so there are certain things that have been proved to work and those are true, which is attractively useful for evolutionary biology. Sam believes in objective truth. Like there's an actual truth out there to be discovered. There are things that are true and there are things that are false. I totally agree with him. You believe that, but not for the same reason. Well, I, yeah. I, I don't know, well, as I asked Sam, I don't know what his reason is. Meaning Sam says that stuff, and I don't mean to rip on Sam, but I, I mean, I talk about all this in the book, and I'm sure he can write a really cogent response, because Sam's yeah. a bright guy, and I really like his stuff. I, I, I hate doing this when he's not here. But yeah, no, and, I, and I, yeah. I, you know, we should do it when Sam's here so we can yeah. discuss it. But, it's, it, but the, the fundamental point that I make is, if you are going to argue in favor of reason, if you're gonna argue in favor of will, if you're gonna argue in favor of all of these things, you need to make some fundamental assumptions that are simply not pre objective truth. Evolutionary biology doesn't speak to objective truth. It speaks to what is useful to a species that allows it to survive and thrive, but it doesn't speak to what's true. If the species didn't exist, would two plus two equals four be true? Mm -hmm. Sam would say yes, and I would say why? because the species doesn't exist to use it. So what, what does that even mean? There's the Judeo-Christian ethics, and this is where Greek teleology and Judeo-Christian ethics meet. You know, the Greeks, Aristotle, Plato, they believed there was such a thing as an objective truth. They believed that there was such a thing as a universe that, a cosmos that is understandable. They believed in the idea of free will, that you could but, make but, a difference in think, that cosmos. But them believing in it, you would say, is just not enough, right? Right. Like just believing in the, in the rational mind is still not enough. Right. And, the, and what Even they though do, that is a type of belief. Right. And I think that they attempt to they they attempt to prove back to, you know, the unmoved mover, and that's a good starting point. This is why Aquinas is so reliant on Aristotelian theology. And the same thing is true for Maimonides. They both uh, like the, the the greatest I think attempt historically to merge the religious philosophy of Judeo Christianity and the and the Greek philosophy of Aristotle and Plato is simultaneously done in the Islamic world and the Christian world and the Judaic world, actually. Uh, it's done by Al-Farabi in the, in the Islamic world, and it's done by Maimonides in the Judaic world, and it's done by, by Aquinas in the, in the Christian world. And it's an attempt to merge, but in the merger, you, you sort of lose the tension that's necessary, I think, because when you completely merge, then it end, you end up in the same place as the, as the theocrat, which is, okay, so natural law and theology are exactly the same, so let's just follow theology. Mm -hmm. Why are we bothering, bothering with this? reasoning it out thing. There's no reason to do that. I think the tension exists for a reason. So then getting us back then, how do we get out of this thing? This, this polarization that we seem to be in, which I do think, I think you got it right here, it is the tension between these two cities right now. So how do we break this? Because we're all sort of caught in it. And I've also been thinking about something that we've talked about a bunch before, that we're running out of communal spaces or communal events to have anything left to bring us together. Nobody really watches the nightly news anymore. We're, after Game of Thrones goes off after this season, yeah, that's we're, right. we're basically out of TV shows. And, and, we're, and, we're stuck with, and we're stuck with cultural events, not actual meaning-based events. Right, we don't, have a going to the, we don't have a moon landing coming up. You know, we're really running short on... I mean, July 4th parades are controversial. Yeah, so, uh, right. yeah. Uh, now going it's, to a parade it's, it's, Yeah, you're, you're parading genocide or something. I mean, it's all nonsense, but that, that as this tension ramps up, the fact that we now have no spaces to let the vents off, that seems to me to be the biggest danger. I totally that agree, and, and this is not just you know, people on the right saying this, people on the left are recognizing this. I mean, Robert Putnam is a sociologist at Harvard. He writes this great book called Bowling Alone, and in it he talks about the, the sort of meme diversity is our strength. And he says, yeah, I used to believe this diversity is our strength stuff. And then I looked at the social science and what I found is that as ethnic diversity in a place increases, the only two things that increase are protest marches and television watching, unless, unless there's a common purpose. If there's a common purpose, then diversity is your strength. So in other words, if you go to a church mm -hmm. and you look at the church, a bunch of diverse faces, people with different experiences, but they're all there to have a common purpose, worship God and take care of each other, 
then diversity is great. Yeah. All the experiences, you can tell each other about it, you have the same goal. That's all fantastic. He says the same thing about the Army. You go to the Army, and you see an incredibly diverse group of people. I mean, we, know, we both know a lot of people who serve in the military, and the, the amount of cross-racial friendship in the military is amazing, right? For, for people who just grew up in secular society, and where it's like, yeah, I have my black friend. And they, 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 but that's not true in the military. In the military, I mean, people legitimately bond across races because they're forced into proximity yeah. where they are. It's like sports, nobody cares. Correct, nobody sports cares. is another great example, right? They, yeah. they have the same common goal. Well, so the question becomes for our society, what is our common goal? And it seems like that common goal is receding mm -hmm. because some of the fundamental things I think that we are all supposed to agree on, right, the free speech, democracy, the use of free will, the use of responsibility, even things as fundamental as that are dissipating in, in response to people saying, you know what, all this is a lie. The only way to attain power and protection for my group is return to tribalism, which is intersectionality on the one hand and, and white supremacy on the other. Uh, or we are going to get rid of, of all of this stuff in the name of the collective because the individual no longer matters. Like the, I talk in the, in the book about this kind of fourfold matrix for human happiness, uh, that we all exist as human beings on a couple of levels, as, members of, uh, as individuals and then as members of community. And we are all these things, right? I mean, people will say, the communists will say you're just a member of the community, basically. And then libertarians will say you're only an individual. And the truth is neither of those things. You are a member of a community and you're an individual and they are simultaneous and inextricable. And so you need to, so the human happiness in individual exists when you have the following four things and in a society can exist when you have the following four things. Individual, individual purpose. So you get up in the morning, you're on a desert island. What do you do today? Are you nihilistic? Do you have something to do? What makes, what gives you meaning? Communal purpose, meaning what can we all get together to do and what's our goal together? As America, are we here to spread liberty? Are we here to preserve liberty? Are we here to create economic equality? What is our goal as a community? And how do we not quash individual purpose in that? There has to be a balance, right? Because if communal purpose is too strong, you quash the individual. And then there's individual capacity. You have to feel like you as a person are in control of your own life, capable of forging forth into the kind of adventuring wilderness, which is the American mentality. And you have to have communal capacity, a system that allows me to, as an individual, thrive while allowing us as a community to mobilize when need be. If you have these four things, then you can be a, a happy individual and you can be, have a happy society. Now, the way I think this is best balanced in terms of government is that government is weak enough not to attack you as an individual, but is strong enough to mobilize when we really need to mobilize to protect those individual rights and to protect the, the system at large. That's, that's where I think the founders got it exactly right. It's why I think that I rely to a very heavy extent on the social fabric as opposed to government to create a fake social fabric. I think the left relies on the government to create a sense of community. I don't feel a sense of community in government. I don't care about the people in government. I don't think they care about me. Uh, I think that the people who care about me are in my family, in my community. I think the, broad, the more broadly we share values, the more I care about people in the broader community. Mm -hmm. um, but th there's a sense on the left that the way that we create a social fabric is by having a very powerful government. In 2012, I was at the DNC when they flashed on the overhead screen that the government is the only thing that we all, uh, the, only, uh, the government is the only thing we all share. And I thought to myself, well, that's a Wait, bunch of- Wait, flashed that on the screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it sounds was, like it was, 1984. Right, it was very, it was, it was really, like, I saw it, I was like, I can't believe that this is a thing that's up on yep. the screen. The only thing we all share, really? Like, that's, that's where we're all participating together? Because it seems to me that we all, we all share in a bunch of different things. And the fewer things we engage in, the more we're going to need to rebuild that capacity from outside in. I don't like outside in compulsion. So what do we do then about the nationwide, or na it's not even nationwide, it's worldwide now. I mean, the things so, that were, after this last year of being on tour, the same things that we're talking about here all the time within an American context are happening in virtually every Western society at some level. So what do we do to rebuild some of those those common public spaces? Like what what is it we should be doing? So right? I think that, 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 would help that. so there there are a couple things. One, the government really needs to stop tearing down religious institutions because historically speaking, religious institutions have been the bulwark of of the social networks that most people rely on. And we living in big cities don't tend to rely on it as much, but out in the sticks, people really rely on this stuff. Can you give one really more important. push for, for my atheist viewers and my leftist sure. viewers that may remain, or the progressives, can you give them one more push on why they shouldn't fear that? Okay, you shouldn't fear that because so long as there is not government compulsion from religious people in religious communities towards others, the fact that people are belonging to churches is a wonderful thing. They're supporting each other. They're giving charity to each other. They're, they're making sure that you don't have to pay for them. They're the ones who are making sure that there is a social fabric people can rely upon. You want less opioid overdoses? You want... You want 
less people who are unemployed and unemployable. You want less people who are following into, following into deaths of despair. They need a social fabric. You're not creating it, and don't pretend you are. You're sitting in the city far away from these people, and when you rip on their church and when you suggest that their church is the obstacle, you are taking away the one connection to social fabric that people have. Tim Carney has a new book called Alienated America in which he looks at various communities, and what he finds is that it's not even an economic thing. People on the left and the right populists are like, well, we can fix all this with econ economics. We just put some tariffs here. We put some subsidies here. We grant universal basic income. That's going to fill this gap for these people. The question is not lack of benefits. There are unemployment benefits. There's welfare. <clears throat> there's food stamps. There's plenty of benefits available for a lot of people. That's not the question. The question is where do you find connection with other human beings? And while you can sit in a place where you feel like you have connection, and especially if you're a college graduate who's watching this show in a big city, you do have an AirSat social connection, like a different kind of, yeah. AirSat isn't right, a different kind of social connection with people you went to college with and people you hang out with that doesn't exist in huge swaths of the country. And the, fir the first place people go to get connection is their church. When those churches disappear, the communities die. And then people there are left without even the motivation to move. So th that's one thing that, and secular, by the, the, again, this is not restricted to religious people like me who are saying this. There, Robert Putnam is a secular guy. He says you get rid of the church, you got a real problem on your hands. There are plenty of sociologists who are looking at the death of churches and saying, what's going to fill this gap? Well, it's I see it now. I mean, I don't come from that default position necessarily, but I do see it now. I, I mean, after being with Jordan on this tour, the, when he would talk about the, the importance of the stories uh, of religion, I could see people, there, there's, it's not a coincidence that people could start thinking about these stories, the messages in these stories, and then suddenly there were thousands of people that I was meeting that were, they stopped uh, doing drugs and they stopped drinking this and they right. made amends with their children or, I mean, every day I saw this for the, the this last is, This year. is right, and, and this is that the other- That can't be a coincidence. And, the, and this is the other element of, of that, that we really need to re-inculcate, and that is that the smart people don't have all the solutions. But the one thing that you can do is solve your own problems. And this is, this is a mindset thing. So notice that everything that I'm saying has nothing to do with governmental compulsion. It's the opposite. I want the government out of everything because I don't think that compulsion is going to fix any of this. The, the biggest thing that needs to change is people need to re-embrace the spirit of adventure in their own lives. And this is something that I, I really believe that this is the thing that makes Jordan most popular. So this is what Jordan says. Life is a struggle. Life is chaotic. Life is difficult. Go and forge forth in spite of those things. And this is what makes you a man. Right? This is what makes you a, a woman. This is what makes you a person worthy of having freedom. I think that's true. I think it's fundamentally a religious message in nature. And it's certainly an inspirational one. And we have a society where we've basically said to people, no, you know what, you got a problem, I can solve it for you. The smart people will solve it for you. We'll solve it through UBI, we'll solve it through tariffs, we'll solve it through, through going after China and Mexico. You're never gonna have to leave your hometown. It was, I had this conversation with Tucker Carlson, and Tucker's a really interesting dude. And we were talking about, specifically, his sort of anti-tech take. So he's, mm -hmm. he's very concerned about self-driving trucks destroying millions of jobs. I'm a little bit more sanguine about that. I don't think it's gonna happen overnight. I think that you still need drivers behind the wheels, but in any case, he was, there was one point during the conversation where Tucker said something to the effect of, you know, so you're gonna say to a bunch of people who are living in the town where their grandparents are buried that they need to pick up and move. And what I'm saying is they should be able to stay there and have jobs. And I said, right. Like this is, he said, you want them to leave the town where their, where their parents are and where their grandparents died? And I said, right, or biblically speaking, leave the land of your fathers and go to a land that you know not, right? I mean, this is, the, the spirit of the individual forging forth is what made the country fantastic. One statistic that is just utterly astonishing is that in an era where we have this rising underclass of folks who have sort of been left behind, we have less mobility in the United States than any time in modern American history. People are leaving home less often hmm. than they did. And people are saying, well, it's because they're living with their parents. Fine. Why aren't they moving where the jobs are? I mean, this was literally what every one of our parents did, right? I mean, I don't know where your parents yeah. grew up. Yeah. My, my parents grew up in Chicago, and they moved to Boston, and they moved to L.A. Brooklyn right. and Westchester. Right, exactly. Like, everyone in California's original story was that no one was born in California. Yeah. Right? Right, like, very, right, right? Like, I was born in L.A. I'm one of the only people I knew who's born in L.A., right? This is, and and that, that sort of movement, this, this hunger to go out there and adventure and take control of your own life, that needs to be re-inculcated. And that comes... We, we have did, to cut did against... Move, did you move him on that at all? Because I know that... I'm on Tucker tonight. Right? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. going on all the time, and I have these discussions with him, and I'm... Uh, did you move him on that? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't really right, think so. Right, I mean, this is a fact. Right. Don't care about your feelings. Thing. It, it, what he's saying there, it does feel right. Like, if your whole family, if your family lived in a town, right. a mining town for 100 years, it doesn't feel right. I mean, this is right. what I would say about the baker and the, and the gay wedding cake. It's like, it doesn't feel right that you can't get the... Right. There, but that doesn't mean that the government should 
fix the problem, right? Or can fix the problem, right? And and this is. And again, I think that there's a mentality shift that's happened. It, I think it's true of immigration, too. I think it has real policy ramifications. This idea that you were born in America, therefore you're owed a bunch of stuff. And I just don't think that that's, frankly, I, I don't think it's a good perspective. I think on a religious level, it's not a religious perspective. I mean, my perspective is that you're effectively owed nothing, right? You're owed, you're owed the adventure. You're owed the freedom to be able to do what it is that you want to do. And then the reason you need the social fabric is to help the people who can't do it without the, the hand up. And it's, it's funny, you talk to people who live in religious communities, and because they've had the social fabric, they instinctively feel like the government has filled a lot of the social fabric in, in a lot of big cities. But you talk to people who live in religious communities, and everyone has a story that's like this, where it's like there was somebody in the community who's struggling, so the rabbi got together a bunch of people, and they gave him some money, and the guy knew where the money came from, and he went out, and he made a plan, and he fixed it. And, and that was the way that things got fixed. Now, is that gonna fill every single gap? No, I mean, you do need local government sometimes to fill these gaps. Local is better than national because you have more sympathy with people who live close to you and you see the, the impact of the problem where you live. But the, the idea that you need a social fabric, it, it's why I don't consider myself libertarian, even though I'm libertarian on, social, on government policy, mm -hmm. because I think the, the mistake that some libertarians make is to suggest that libertarianism applies on a social level too. Right, so that, that, in right. Of its, that limited government in and of itself is enough to keep everything going. Right, and I don't, think that's, that's I don't think that's correct. I mean, I think that rights and duties are two sides of the same coin, and, and as Washington suggested, that you, know, you need a moral people to sustain liberty. So uh, this is a bit of a non sequitur, sort of, but maybe not. Um, so do you think this is why the left is going so bananas with the Jews at the moment? <laughs> that there's some connection there because Jews did get up and went? I mean, when you well, were I mean, describing I, I, that conversation with Tucker, I was thinking, that's the end of Fiddler on the Roof, right? right. They don't want to leave when uh, Tevye is saying yeah, goodbye yeah, exactly. to Laser Wolf. You know, they don't want to leave. I'm going to Chicago, you're going wherever. Right. But it's like, we have to go now. We have to forge something new. And Jews have kind of been doing that forever. Well, and that is the antithesis of what the left is offering now. So I, I think there is truth to that, and I don't think it's restricted to Jews. I think that you've seen the intersectional hierarchy change radically based on which minority groups are perceived to be more successful. So what you see is the, is the left suggesting that Asians are no longer minorities yep. in the United States. Can't get into Harvard. Right, you can't get into Harvard. You're not, you're not truly on the intersectional scale because you're, and now they're doing it with gay folks, right? Because people gave Asians everything when they came here. Right, right exactly. Didn't Asians and Indians just get everything? They were just, you know, working these hard jobs and, and running little hot dog stands and 7-Elevens just because that was, you know, why not? Right, you know? exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then they worked hard. And, and you see this is happening on the fringe left already with, with gay folks, right? So the idea that you saw that article at Slate where yeah. they did this with, with Buttigieg, where they were like, well, where? is he intersectional enough because he grew up white and he grew up privileged and he went to good schools, but also he's gay, so he's a little intersectional. I he's not was, like does intersectional. Does he count as oppressed? Does he, what right, level was, of oppression? Correct, does yeah. he count as a gay guy? Or it, was, it, was, it was legitimately, did he count as a gay guy, I think, was, was sort of the headline. It was like, yeah. he's not fully, like, I don't understand. Well, he, the, he's married to a man. So last yeah. I checked, yeah. I mean, like, well, first of all, I'm not even sure what they're going for there, except for he doesn't rate high enough on the in, in the uh, oppression scale. Yeah. Well, the craziest one of those that I ever saw was a couple of years ago. I think it was it was either Out Magazine or Advocate. I can't remember which one. When they said that Peter Thiel is no longer gay, right? Because his politics don't line up with gay. So what would really make you gay? The physical part? No, no, that doesn't. Fact doesn't matter. Right. What matters is how we feel. And you're going to, by the way, they'll come right. after Kamala Harris on the same grounds. Her, her one parent is Jamaican, one parent is Indian. I mean, that's, that's not traditional, grew up in the inner city. I mean, her, her dad, I think, was a professor at Stanford or something. Like, they'll, they'll come for, for anybody who doesn't, like, we'll, we'll pretend intersectionality applies until it no longer applies. So does that make you very hopeful then? Because I think we're seeing minority groups crack. We're seeing Asians go... Whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't I mean, want to be on so. the reverse side of this. Jews are finally going, wait, we don't have to vote 80% Democrat. Black people, I mean, just the fact that now reparations is becoming uh, virtually every Democratic candidate is yeah. now talking about reparations. To me, regardless, I know you have a little bit of a love-hate thing with Candace Owens, but it's like, she did it. I'm just like Candace. I mean, no, 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 yeah, I, yeah. I don't yeah, mean yeah. dislike, but I mean, you guys, you guys go at it and that, that's fine. Um, I think more it's like I just sit here and sometimes she goes at me. Yeah, all right, whatever, whatever <laughs> yeah. it is. I was, with her, <laughs> couple, fair, I was yes. with her a couple days ago. She likes you. I, I meant more that you, don't, you just don't agree yeah. on everything. That's well, fine. Correct. Yeah. The point being, when I see all these Democrats suddenly going, oh, we should have a commission to figure out reparations, it's like, whoa, they, Candace really must have done something here within the black community. Because well, now all they're going is all we got left is cash. Well, I, I think that they're, you know, I, I hope that that's true. 
you know, I, I don't know the data bear it out, but I, I certainly hope that there is that cracking that, that is taking place. But the, the left has a couple of very powerful forces, and one of them is, as we discussed, the attempt to make it uncomfortable to have different thoughts or to engage with people who have different thoughts, that you are no longer welcome in the circle of the, of the woke if you have a conversation with somebody on there. I mean, legitimately have a conversation or watch a video. I mean, there was a story that was out of, I think it was Michigan State two weeks ago, where a student at Michigan State College Fix reported this, was watching one of my videos on YouTube, and the roommate made, an, made a rights violation complaint to the administration at Michigan State for the student watching my video, and the administration was like, fine, we'll move you. I mean, like, yeah. like it, it's come to the point where if you mention names, like people who legitimately don't know anything about you, don't know anything about Candace, don't know anything about me, don't know anything about Jordan, They'll make claims about people they legitimately cannot back up because they've never engaged with their content, but the very fact that they haven't engaged with the content is their credibility on speaking on the content. Because mm -hmm. if they ever engaged on the content, then they wouldn't believe all these things, but they don't engage, and therefore they are good. Lack of engagement is good, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's not that you engage and now you're better because you've had a better conversation. If you didn't engage, you're better. So those are the, the that's the countervailing intimidation factor that's, that's taking place, and that I think is still quite powerful. It's why every single Democratic candidate I mean, it, it really is incredibly powerful. Every single Democratic candidate effectively skipped APAC this year, yeah, because Ilhan Omar has impact, and because folks on the and because folks on the hard left hate Israel, and and that has impact. And then they all showed up for Al Sharpton, who's legitimately one of the worst people in modern American yeah, politics, like, like the in worst modern American sort of history. Race baiter. He, he ran a Jesse Smollett hoax and accused an actual human being of committing a rape against a black girl who was not raped. He accused Stephen Pagones of raping a black girl and then scrawling racial slurs on her body in shit. And he is, mm -hmm. and yeah. it was not, it was all false. Yeah. And he was, he called Jews diamond merchants. He, he suggested white interlopers were taking over Freddy's Fashion Mart and, there, and then somebody went and burned down the place. Like, He's the worst guy, Al Sharpton, and every Democrat showed up at the National Action Network because to be woke means to be in the club. Like, we don't, here's the thing about those of us in the IDW, people think that we have a club. It's, it's not a club, it's just people who like to talk about things. And, and anybody is welcome to the club, which is why you see like these weird videos where people who we've never talked to or had conversations with are suddenly quote unquote members of the IDW. Yeah. Like we talk with each other and there's like a core group I think of us who every so often, like really every so often go out and get drinks or have dinner, but that's like, that, that's not a, that's not the same thing as this. You're unwelcome in the club if you don't if you don't do X. Like that's that's is not the a, weird thing that if the if this if the IDW let's say whatever it is at the moment you're right it's not a car, we're not walking around with a card we don't have a clubhouse you know all those <laughs> things but like if this collection and of course it's it's way wider than just us but if if this middle collection which seemingly it's pretty small and it, and it's kind of getting smaller because it's it's just getting tougher to have centrist opinions right and also if this thing doesn't hold. Yeah, I mean that's What's right. After well, and, 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 and you can see, that? and you can see how viciously the left is trying to carve it apart. By what they'll do is they'll come after me, and then they'll ask you for comment, or they'll come after yeah. Sam, and then they'll ask me for comment, or they'll and come yet, after I Jordan, never, and they'll go after. Uh, but that's why I think it's important. I know you know people attack me. Oh, he's always he's always shitting on the left. But it's like this is the perfect example of what's going on here. On the right, does anyone on the right relentlessly, viciously, and dishonestly attack the Weinstein brothers, or 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 and or Sam even, or anyone that's on the left? They don't. I mean, they I, agree to disagree. If you read it the, really is as simple as that. I mean, it's amazing. If you read the comments on the, I, I take Yang as an example because it just happened. But if you read the comments on the Sunday special that I did with Yang, yeah. there is nothing like legitimately. The, I never read the comments, but I was curious. There is nothing but appreciation that Yang would even come on the show. Yeah. That's the entire thing. It's like, oh look, a cordial conversation between people who disagree, that's so nice. Like, how pathetic is it that that is considered like the big win here? There, was, there wasn't a single comment about like, oh, Shapiro destroyed Yang there, because that wasn't the purpose of it. Everybody got what it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. It's a conversation, and that's great. Did he like, move you on anything, like a UBI situation? Well, I mean, I'd read his book. His so, uh, right, I, I, I'd read his book, and, I, and I, I didn't find it utterly convincing on a UBI. I think that, as I've said before, when it comes to UBI, if we reach the point of absolute crisis where nothing else, like, it, let's put it this way, UBI as negative income tax in lieu of all of the welfare systems we currently have, I would sign on to in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. right, the, the idea so, of we get rid of, we get so rid of- a real of the, repeal and replace. Right, if you repeal all the welfare programs and you replace it with a single check that is signed, then, I, but I think the promises of UBI are a little bit too big for its britches. So people are saying, well, it'll solve the opioid epidemic or it'll solve the, as I say in the book, I think it's a crisis of meaning, not a crisis of money. Uh, and so I don't think that's gonna solve it. Uh, if the idea is that people are going to be liberated, as Andrew says in his book, to go and do art and volunteering and charity, 
I don't see any evidence just, of that. That's the part I don't. Right. That, that's all. the part where I was like, um, no. Even because... if even if you could get me on the robots are replacing all our regular job parts. Right. So let's say you could get me on that. Mm -hmm. The other part is just that it takes away something about fundamental human nature, about what you're talking about before, about the individual going out there and getting theirs. Right. That you would just end up having this class of people that would be given just enough. I mean, right. you have a new welfare right. state. And, and what, effect, and what, right? right, exactly. And what he said was, well, it's not enough to actually live on, it's just enough to actually supplement. And what I said is, so what's the limiting principle? Like, is right. it just the 1,000 or... Is a politician going to come around next week and say it ought to be three thousand, and then you what, have? What did he say that? Because I haven't. He seen didn't. He didn't really. Yet. I don't think he really firmly addressed it. Because that's the key um, question, right? It's right. Not, well, okay, we can get a thousand bucks, and we're good. It's correct. That literally, the next week there will be somebody who says a thousand and one bucks. You just then, prices right people gonna, out, right? Yeah, <laughs> and what are they going to say about the lefties who want a thousand? They'll call them racist or? Uh, that, that's exactly right. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, the, the, there are some problems in implementation of of UBI that exist with the welfare state. Also, a lot of the studies that suggest that there's the same level of employment. Those are temporary UBI attempts, right? If there were a permanent UBI, uh, I, I think that you would see a decline in employment. But also, as I said to him, there's a conflict between what UBI says it's trying to do and what it actually would do. So I think it would do the same thing as the welfare state, and that's why I say, like, as a replacement for the welfare state, I'm kind of warm to it. But you're it, just like, let's give it a shot, basically. Right, right like, exactly. We have something that's failing, let's... Uh, right, and also because I'd rather have the government sign uh, an understandable check rather than you have to go through, uh, you have to de-incentivize de work or de-incentivize fatherhood or, de you know, all these incentive-based structures. I, I, I'm not a fan, mm -hmm. and they've been rather ineffective. But, it, but as a general principle, the idea that it's going to solve the work crisis, what he talks about in his book is the crisis of people who don't have jobs, and that crisis is the not having of the job, not merely the not having of the money. Mm -hmm. So signing people a check in lieu of a job doesn't actually, like he points out in the book, the number of people on disability has been rising dramatically. Right, and they're all getting a check. And are they happy? Are they spending their time volunteering? Are they spending their time down at the local way station helping people? Or are they, you know, well, taking drugs and it's, hurting again, each other? Again, it's like, it all sounds good. Medicare for all, it sounds good. We will all right. have the same thing. Now, we know that that's not going to be the case because, of course, well, now they're talking about getting rid of private insurance all Which is insane. I mean, that's fully, but they have to do it because otherwise doctors just will not accept Medicare yeah. reimbursement rates. I mean, that's the reality. Again, you know, as somebody who works closely with people in the medical industry, yeah. and in fact sleeps with a person in the medical industry, yes. you know that that you know the the idea that doctors are going to just accept sixty percent on the dollar of what they're making right now is absolute sheer nonsense. But also, it's such a disconnect of what of what I think they view. I mean, I get it that they think government is something that I don't think it should be. But it's like, what right would the government have to tell a doctor he can't be in the private business that he wants to be in? Right, I mean, and they they actually think that's okay. I mean. Quite literally, right. Kamala and I think uh, Cory Booker and a couple and the, of others. They think it's no good. No private insurance. Well, I mean, this is another. This is another thing that I asked Yang about because he said he was for Medicare for all. And there's a section in his book where he says, "So how are we going to deal with the fact that doctors are going to just stop going to medical school? Because that's a real thing that will happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, already, if you want to see how perverse incentives work in the medical industry, look how many people come out of medical school and go into what are called the road. The, the, the road fields is radiology, ophthalmology, anesthesiology, and dermatology. Why? Those are the least regulated fields. There's the least Medicare there. Nobody's taking reimbursement rates. Those are all areas where people basically show up with an insurance company or cash in hand. Yep. That's where everybody's going. It's where all the money is. So that's how perverse incentives work. He says in the book, well, we're going to have to convince doctors that basically they need to rethink about what the lifestyle of a doctor is going to be, that they're not going to live high on the hog anymore, that they're going to you know, be putting out more for the public service. And I thought, well, you can do that, but it's not going to be the same people. If Does you think... he say how to do that? No. I mean, he, he, he sort of says that we should, that we should just people will, will have to be informed that the incentive structure is different. And here's the thing. If you have a different incentive structure, you're going to get a different thing. Mm -hmm. My wife would not have gone to medical school if she were assured of coming for 11 years, if she were assured of coming out making $65,000 or $100,000, right? The, the reality is that she wanted a certain lifestyle. That's why she went to medical school. You change those incentives. You think all these guys who are going in to be surgeons are going to spend years on end doing this so that they can then work for years on end working for Medicare? Does that sound awesome to anyone? Like this is the reason that smart people become doctors is because smart people would like to make money and be paid for their work. This is why smart like yes, there is a self sacrificial component to all of this. It's there are easier ways to make money than being a doctor. But to eliminate the money factor is to eliminate half the reason that people become doctors in the first place. You want a lot more people who are lawyers and, and McKinsey associates. This is the way to do it. I have a good friend, two or three best friends from childhood since second grade, who was like my chief sparring political partner our, our whole lives. Uh, and he's now become a, a huge Trump supporter. And why? Because he was a doctor, he went to medical school, raised all the debt, 
realized he could never live in New York where he grew up. He's now in Texas and he's often doing things that have not to make money now because it's so yeah. hard. And then he became a Trump supporter because of Obamacare, because he was crushed with paperwork and bureaucracy and nonsense. And now to make money because it's so much harder than just doing the procedures, he's basically doing like like medical real estate things. Yeah. And it just shows you that the whole system, I mean, that's just one guy, but it's like yeah, the well, whole system is out of whack. Doctors are going into concierge care specifically because of this. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are full apps that exist where you're paying like 99 bucks a month and then a doctor will show up at your door. Like there are so many ways that we could make medical care so, I mean, online should be such an asset for medical mm. care, right? We should, there's so many, getting rid of licensing requirements, as I suggest, it would be a great thing. Like there, there are things that we can actively do to do this. And the truth is for healthy people and for people who have private health care insurance, there really isn't a problem. Like we like to talk about how it's too expensive. Why do you think we have millions and millions of jobs in the healthcare industry? Like mm -hmm. what do they think happens when they nationalize this thing? All those jobs just transfer over to government or are a lot of those jobs lost because those people don't work for anybody right. anymore. Why is it that they, they, people ignore the upsides of Well, the, what do they think? Does anyone answer that question? What are you gonna do with all those people in, no, at the private No, and they, and they are don't- Are they gonna all be hired by the government to do nothing? Right, and, and do they, and nobody seems to understand that the, the reason that the majority of new drugs and procedures are discovered in the United States is because we are paying those outsized prices. So when Trump says that we are paying for everybody else, that is true, we are paying for everybody else. But if we stop paying for everybody else, they just will stop producing those drugs here because why else would they produce the drugs here? Like this is, our system is not good, but to pretend that our system is like the worst system on planet Earth or that people are dying, I mean, quick statistic that nobody likes to cite but is true, if you get rid of, of shooting uh, of homicides and car accident death where people die like at the scene, from the American death rates, America has the number one life expectancy in the industrialized world. Mm. Those are not medical issues. Those are issues of people shooting each other and people getting car wrecks a lot here in the United States. So, you know, that's, and as far as us spending per capita, like insane amounts of money, we spend more than other countries. It is relatively in line with the OECD income. So for, for on a per capita income basis, we spend a lot of money. We also make a lot of money here in the United States. And the medical industry here is a huge part of the American economy. All of Pittsburgh is basically the medical industry now as opposed to the steel industry, and that is a very good thing for Pittsburgh. So the answer to a lot of this is deregulation, not re-regulation, but again, those are conversations I think that can be had, but I think that people are not being realistic about what they expect from the system, and they're not realistic about the downsides of, of systems that are, that are completely nationalized. I mean, in my opinion, if you're actually gonna get the government deeply involved, we gotta have a Swiss system where basically people are paying a percentage of their salary into private insurance and then they are, and then they are expected to do that, right? Like the individual mandate, if you're gonna get the government involved, is not the world's worst idea. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that it's now stacked with enormous amounts of regulation uh, and inefficiency and bureaucratic inefficiency. And that, but I think again that a free market is better than any of that stuff. But I also think that you ought to take responsibility if you are on it. Like, if you don't buy insurance and then you get hit by a car, I'm sorry, that, that would be a you problem. Like the, 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 that's why we need a social fabric where I care about you. Yeah. But on a governmental level, this idea that you're not going to increase the rates of use with government care is just a lie. Right, people but we are, are gonna pay for those people no matter what, right? I mean, right. they're not, well, they're it's not against, gonna it's turn a, them around at the, at the emergency Right. Room, it's so a, we are gonna pay for those Right, people. but it, getting, getting hit by the car is usually not the real issue. Usually the real issue is how do you pay for the person who didn't buy health insurance for years and then gets, uh, and gets a heart condition that requires you know, years long care. Mm -hmm. Like the person who's in the ER is gonna get paid for, that we, we all end up paying for it with an elevated insurance rates and all, all the rest of it. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the problem of the chronically unhealthy, which is a very small percentage of the population, but the most expensive percentage, that is not really a rationale for overturning healthcare that 90% of people seem to enjoy. Like it, it also is gonna make you hate people for no reason. You're gonna go to In-N-Out or McDonald's and see a table of four obese people stuffing their faces, drinking high well, fructose corn syrup and everything else, and you're gonna go, wait a minute, these people are, are all they're living off my dime. themselves right, they're and living I'm off my paying dime. their, I mean, that, well, this, this is, is a horrible, I mean, this goes to the it's community. Funny. It's funny. No one wants to look at that and think that. Well, this is, this but, is, a, this is why, you know, I've, I've said, people who try to compare, for example, the Nordic, the Nordic healthcare model to the US healthcare model, you're not comparing equivalent populations. People eat healthy things in Norway. <laughs> people in the United States eat nothing but crap all the time. I was just in Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, these people look good. Right, I mean, this is, it's a, it's a yeah. much healthier population. And this is why if you actually want to compare the efficacy of healthcare systems, you don't look at the generalized population of the United States and the generalized population of Norway. They're also absurdly tiny countries. Right, the, with yeah. five million people. I mean, the LA County is 11 million people or something. <laughs> right. What you do is you compare n people who are Norwegian 
in America to people who are Norwegian in Norway. And what you find is that people in, who are Norwegian in America outperform on nearly every aspect people who are Norwegian in Norway. Then you are comparing apples to apples. Like, we compare apples to oranges, and then we're like, well, why doesn't this work over here? Because they're not the same thing. That's why it doesn't work over here. All right, Shapiro, let's go dystopian. You ready? OK. Let's say everything that you've written about here, everything that we're trying to do, all these conversations mm -hmm. we're all having, it all, it all just explodes. It does, yeah. it does not work. We, the ideas that we're fighting for fail in the face of postmodernism, of what's being taught at these colleges, of what the media is throwing at everybody. And we get more and more of these people in government and all of these things. I think about this sometimes, that what will happen to the outlier people like us in the future? Do you, do you ever think about that? Well, that, I think, I think that right now, for example, for all these people that think Trump is Hitler and all this stuff, Trump tweets anything and then a hundred blue check journalists tell him to go fuck himself and you're gonna be in jail and a zillion things and Trump does nothing. That's not even a defense of anything Trump says, that's just reality. But now let's do it the other way. Imagine now we've got one of these far lefties. Yeah, Bernie's, believe, Bernie's president, yeah, yeah. Who believe that government is the end all be all to everything. And now the outliers who have all been called Nazis all along, right? The Ben Shapiros and everybody else that have been called the worst things in the world. Now, now government and tech is against us. And now we're doing the same exact things that the lefties of today are doing. Yep. How, how do you think that's gonna go? Well, I mean, th this is why at Daily Wire, and I know you've been looking into this too, alternative means of distribution are the entire ballgame. I mean, that, that, we understand that when it comes to the left, you cannot live on their largesse. And like, for God's sake, at the beginning of the year, they came after me and tried to boycott me over making the most anodyne point on abortion I think I've ever made in my life. Right? They, 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 tried, they legitimately tried to knock my sponsors off my show yeah. for suggesting that pro-lifers don't want to kill any baby, no matter what that baby would turn out to be, because we don't believe that you can kill babies for any rationale based on a minority report reasoning. And I mentioned baby Hitler in this context yeah. because that had been a thought experiment that was used by people up to and including Tom Hanks mm -hmm. for legitimately years. Mm -hmm. And they tried to boycott my show based on that. I mean, it was insane. The, so we're not focusing on living on the largesse of the left when it comes to this sort of stuff. We're building a subscription system at Daily Wire. This is why we encourage people to subscribe because then you can get our content no matter what you do because we it's all vertically integrated. I know that you're looking at stuff like that as well. Yeah. Um, you know, on, on a tech level, we're building alternatives and that's what we ought to be doing. Uh, on a generalized level, I think what we're watching, and it's, and it's really pretty sad, is that people like us are gonna end up in places with people who agree with people like us. Meaning that I live in a Jewish community where I'm pretty popular because it's an Orthodox community. I'm Orthodox. And I went to lunch with you at a kosher place, and if I had to take one more picture of you, I was going to kill. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that's you know, that, th those are my folks. But I've spent my entire life living in Los Angeles, a place where the vast majority of people disagree with me, or in Cambridge, where yeah. everyone disagrees with me. <laughs> and that's and I like that. I think it's nice. I think like I think it's good that there are conversations happening across the aisle as the left seeks to basically censor or destroy anyone who even engages in those conversations, where Joe Rogan becomes alt-right because he has a conversation with me, because I once had a conversation with you, and you once had a conversation with Alex Jones. Right, like this is the way that it works. Clearly, we've all pushed people to the extreme. Right, I mean, but the, the, and this is, and so once that happens, all that's gonna happen is it's gonna make places like this unlivable for people like us. And I mean, even people who just wanna have conversations. And then you do end up with a real gap in the country that is almost unbridgeable, where it's like everyone agrees in one place and nobody agrees in another place. And that's where, the, if the, that's why, honestly, the checks and balances system is so vital, we mentioned before, because if people in Texas feel like they're running, being run roughshod over by people in California via the national government or the other way around, that's not gonna last, that's not, that's not sustainable. Right, so that's why it's like I don't. Re I like doing this as a thought experiment more than like what could potentially happen. But it seems to me that if we have then no co spaces that we were talking about right. before, and we all do have to get siphoned off into our own thing, just because that's the way the tech landscape is going to work, that it's like yeah, we got the checks and balances, and our system is is pretty damn good. I would say yeah, it's probably, durable. Yeah. I would say it's the best man made thing set right. of ideas probably in the history of of all time. Um, but how can it survive in an information war? You know what I mean? How can it survive in a time when, for all we know, the next, whoever runs for president isn't gonna accept the results of the election? Well, Stacey the, Abrams still not accepting the results. Like, they're, they're undermined. They claim Trump wasn't gonna accept the right, results right, of right. the election. And now it's like, that's what they're doing. They're trying to undermine everything. And if we don't have 
enough co-spaces to work it out. Well, this is this is why we have a very short window right now to pour resources into grabbing as many eyeballs as possible and ensuring that as many people see countervailing material as possible because you just don't know when that window is going to slam shut. Yeah. I mean, that, that really was it. You have to grab as many people as possible and let them know that there are alternative places where they can get your stuff because otherwise... You know, here's what I'm concerned about mostly. What I'm concerned about is that you're going to see a move by Democrats in Congress and from the presidency to do exactly what Mark Zuckerberg wants, right, where the FCC is suddenly regulating speech on Facebook and to relieve the obligations of Facebook to do it themselves. And suddenly, if you are labeled not alt-right, but yeah. alt-right adjacent, yeah. based on the fact that you once interviewed a person who once interviewed a person who once stood next to a person who was once wearing a shirt, then, you know, then you're screwed. So that, that, that's where I, I don't think that the, the, this is why, you know, you and I make the same distinction. I've made a distinction for years and years between the liberals and the left. If the left continues to conquer the liberals, I think that it's going to be a rough time ahead and we better have these alternative methods of distribution or we're, we're screwed at that point. All right, so let's finish with this then. Um, when I was on Candace's show a week or two ago, I said to her, you know, I see something, so, it's so obvious to me that if you care about ideas, if you want to live in a tolerant, pluralistic society, all of those things, it's very obvious. The center right basically is where, is where that's at. It, it just is. Do you think there's room for, peop, for the center right, say conservatives, to have a little more openness when it comes to like, you know, we've had the abortion discussion many mm -hmm. times. I'm, I mean, I'm really struggling with it. And the further that the left goes on eight month abortions and, and all of that, yeah. and post-life abortions and <laughs> post-life abortions, I yeah. mean, this crazy stuff. It's, it's making my position incredibly difficult. Tenuous, yeah. And I think, a lot of, I think a lot of decent liberals are struggling with this. How, what do you think the right should do if you guys want to be a little more opening, uh, a little more welcoming, let's say, for people that are are seeing where tolerance actually lives right now. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think you this can is, do on, on issues like that? Because I'm not saying that the right has to be it's one of a pro-choice party or, right. anything, or a pro-choice set of ideas or anything like that. But what, what do you think is, is your job? Uh, well, I mean, one of the, th that is one, maybe the only issue that I can think of where the right generally, and I think correctly, believes in government compulsion, meaning that the, the basic thesis of the right is that when a life is threatened, then the government has a right to step in. This is a life that is threatened. The government has a right to step in. So. This I'm not sure is a bridgeable gap. What I mean by that is that the the right can continue to make the case. Uh, the right should continue to make the case. I mean, it's a case I agree with, um, but I, I can't. I'm not libertarian on this issue because I don't think it's a libertarian issue. So right. here, so there's an actual. I don't mean, I don't mean that yeah. the right has to modify its position. I actually don't mean that. What I mean is just that for the things that might be the differences. If you were if you were just looking to collect ex lefties right now, right. Well, see, I mean, the, here's we're the here, talent group. Like, what, how do you welcome those people? Well, I mean, the, here's here's where I would start. Because I think they're what afraid. I, I think I think most of them have PTSD. I really. Well, that, I think this that, is what I really believe. I mean, the, the first place to start is why don't we start with the stuff where we agree? Because the truth is that the checks and balances of the system, just on a practical level, the checks and balances of the system are not going to allow for full protection of life anytime soon. The, the sort of attempts that have been made on the right to move in a more pro-life direction have been incremental at best. And so if, listen, if that's the issue that's going to, you know, bar you from joining the right, then that's the issue that's going to bar you from joining the right. There's not much I can do about that. But you know, we're, I'm happy to welcome anybody to the conversation, and you don't have to agree with me on abortion to be part of the conversation. Like, I, I, we, you and I don't agree on this, and we, we have this conversation on a pretty routine basis. I do it all the time. So, you know, I, I don't think that this is in it. As I say, there are certain issues where the right is not going to move, and frankly, I don't think the right should move. This is one of those, the, the only issues. Um, but can I make a bold prediction? Sure. 30 years from now, we're going to be sitting here doing this, hopefully in a mm -hmm. bigger garage. Maybe. Um, <laughs> in Texas, and, probably. And yeah. you may well have moved me on the, uh, on the abortion issue, and I think I may have moved you on coming to an anniversary party. What, what do you think about that? I think there's a possibility. I mean, I'd, I'd, have, to, I'd have to think about that. Again, the, the issue, as you know, you know, not to get back yeah, into yeah, well-trod yeah. territory, uh, you know, I... I I think it would be unlikely that you'd move me, but I, I can never rule out the possibility of being moved on anything, obviously. Um, and again, this is this comes back down to, you know, the difference between approving of activity and approving of, of human beings. The, you know, I wouldn't, if you invited me to a party on, on Friday night, I also wouldn't go, right? I mean, like, so, it's just not so something I do. So definitely not a Shabbat. Uh, anniversary uh, a Shabbat party. anniversary, I think, good. probably is out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a Sunday afternoon... Uh, a Sunday afternoon, gay-ish, 
anniversary, Doesn't, like, or or maybe just how about you just the, have like a freaking barbecue, dude? Do, like, yeah, does everything well, have well, to be? No, but the, the party's not going to be gay. It's just yeah, we'll have a barbecue. Okay, It'll just be a barbecue. It, it, Nothing right. gay is going to happen there. When, I, I wasn't worried it was going to turn into an orgy dancing. back there or something. No like, I was, wasn't worried you were going to bring out the village people or something. Do you know something. that gay people have parties just the same? Well, wait, what? What? No, that's crazy. Yeah. No, I was, no, I was, I was pretty well aware of that, in yeah. fact. And in fact, as I've said a thousand times, yeah. happy to go out to dinner, my wife, your husband, happy to go out to dinner and, and do any of that stuff, as long as it's not like, you know, rah, rah, here's the thing you think is sinful, join me in celebrating it. Like that's, but again, that appeals, that applies to a wide variety of sins that, it, I mean, listen, it's harder on, it's harder on members of my family than anybody else. Like I've said before, I wouldn't attend an intermarriage. Right, like a Jew marries an Andrew, I won't attend intermarriage. Yeah. So th this is exactly the same issue. Shapiro, they're giving me the signal that you uh, have a hard yeah, I got, out. I feel like we just I got a radio started. show to do in like five minutes. You gotta get yeah, the exactly. hell out of here. All right, that's Ben Shapiro, Daily Wire, at Ben Shapiro on Twitter. The book is The Right Side of History. Is it number one on Amazon right now? Uh, well, it it's was like, It was number one on the New York Times list in its first week. Nice. So we knocked off Michelle Obama for a week, and then she took revenge and, and knocked us back down to number three. But... But for a week, for a week. That's the battle of the left and the right. <laughs> Encapsulated right there. All right, that's it. Thanks, everybody.